of human bondage by w somerset maughan chapter forty nine the story which philip made out in one way and another was terrible one of the grievances of the women students was that fanny price would never share their gay meals in restaurants and the reason was obvious she had been oppressed by dire poverty he remembered the luncheon they had eaten together when first he came to paris and the ghoulish appetite which had disgusted him he realized now that she ate in that manner because she was ravenous the concierge told him what her food had consisted of a bottle of milk was left for her every day and she brought in her own loaf of bread she ate half the loaf and drank half the milk at midday when she came back from the school and consumed the rest in the evening it was the same day after day philip thought with anguish of what she must have endured she had never given anyone to understand that she was poorer than the rest but it was clear that her money had been coming to an end and at last she could not afford to come any more to the studio the little room was almost bare of furniture and there were no other clothes than the shabby brown dress she had always worn philip searched among her things for the address of some friend with whom he could communicate he found a piece of paper on which his own name was written a score of times it gave him a peculiar shock he supposed it was true that she had loved him he thought of the emaciated body in the brown dress hanging from the nail in the ceiling and he shuddered but if she had cared for him why did she not let him help her he would so gladly have done all he could he felt remorseful because he had refused to see that she looked upon him with any particular feeling and now these words in her letter were infinitely pathetic i can't bear the thought that anyone else should touch me she had died of starvation philip found at length a letter signed your loving brother albert it was two or three weeks old dated from some road in sir Byton, and refused a loan of five pounds the writer had his wife and family to think of he didn't feel justified in lending money and his advice was that fanny should come back to london and try to get a situation philip telegraphed to albert price and in a little while an answer came deeply distressed very awkward to leave my business is presence essential price philip wired a succinct affirmative and next morning a stranger presented himself at the studio my name's price he said when philip opened the door he was a commonish man in black with a band round his bowler hat he had something of fanny's clumsy look he wore a stubbly moustache and had a cockney accent philip asked him to come in he cast sidelong glances round the studio while philip gave him details of the accident and told him what he had done i needn't see her need i said albert price my nerves aren't very good and it takes very little to upset me he began to talk freely he was a rubber merchant and he had a wife and three children fanny was a governess and he couldn't make out why she hadn't stuck to that instead of coming to paris me and mrs price told her paris was no place for a girl and there's no money in art never has been it was plain enough that he had not been on friendly terms with his sister and he resented her suicide as a last injury that she had done him he did not like the idea that she had been forced to it by poverty that seemed to reflect on the family the idea struck him that possibly there was a more respectable reason for her act i suppose she hadn't any trouble with the man had she you know what i mean paris and all that she might have done it so as not to disgrace herself philip felt himself reddening and cursed his weakness price's keen little eyes seemed to suspect him of an intrigue i believe your sister to have been perfectly virtuous he answered acidly she killed herself because she was starving well it's very hard on her family mr carey she only had the right to me i wouldn't have let my sister want philip had found the brother's address only by reading the letter in which he had refused a loan but he shrugged his shoulders there was no use in recrimination he hated the little man and wanted to have done with him as soon as possible albert price also wished to get through the necessary business quickly so that he could get back to london 
they went to the tiny room in which poor Fanny had lived. Albert Price looked at the pictures and the furniture. "'I don't pretend to know much about art,' he said. "'I suppose these pictures would fetch something, wouldn't they?' "'Nothing,' said Philip. "'The furniture's not worth ten shillings.' Albert Price knew no French, and Philip had to do everything. It seemed that it was an interminable process to get the poor body safely hidden away underground. Papers had to be obtained in one place and signed in another. Officials had to be seen. For three days Philip was occupied from morning till night. At last he and Albert Price followed the hearse to the cemetery at Montpersan. "'I want to do the thing decent,' said Albert Price, "'but there's no use wasting money.' The short ceremony was infinitely dreadful in the cold gray morning. Half a dozen people who had worked with Fanny Price at the studio came to the funeral, Mrs. Otter because she was monsieur and thought it her duty, Ruth Chalice because she had a kind heart, Lawson, Clutton, and Flanagan. They had all disliked her during her life. Philip, looking across the cemetery crowded on all sides with monuments, some poor and simple, others vulgar, pretentious, and ugly, shuddered. It was horribly sordid. When they came out Albert Price asked Philip to lunch with him. Philip loathed him now, and he was tired. He had not been sleeping well, for he dreamed constantly of Fanny Price in the torn brown dress hanging from the nail in the ceiling. But he could not think of an excuse. "'You take me somewhere where we can get a regular slap-up lunch. All this is the very worst thing for my nerves.' "'La Venuse is about the best place round here,' answered Philip. Albert Price settled himself on a velvet seat with a sigh of relief. He ordered a substantial luncheon and a bottle of wine. "'Well, I'm glad that's over,' he said. He threw out a few artful questions, and Philip discovered that he was eager to hear about the painter's life in Paris. He represented it to himself as deplorable, but he was anxious for details of the orgies which his fancy suggested to him. With sly winks and discreet snickering he conveyed that he knew very well that there was a great deal more than Philip confessed. He was a man of the world, and he knew a thing or two. He asked Philip whether he had ever been to any of those places in Montmartre which are celebrated from Temple Bar to the Royal Exchange. He would like to say he had been to the Moulin Rouge. The luncheon was very good, and the wine excellent. Albert Price expanded as the processes of digestion went satisfactorily forwards. "'Let's have a little brandy,' he said when the coffee was brought, and blow the expense. He rubbed his hands. "'You know, I've got half a mind to stay over tonight and go back tomorrow. What do you say to spending the evening together? If you mean you want me to take you round Montmartre tonight, I'll see you damned,' said Philip. "'I suppose it wouldn't be quite the thing.' The answer was made so seriously that Philip was tickled. "'Besides, it would be rotten for your nerves,' he said gravely. Albert Price concluded that he had better go back to London by the four o'clock train, and presently he took leave of Philip. "'Well, good-bye, old man,' he said. "'I'll tell you what. I'll try and come over to Paris again one of these days, and I'll look you up, and then we won't have to go on the razzle.' Philip was too restless to work that afternoon, so he jumped on a bus and crossed the river to see whether there were any pictures on view at the Rand Ruelles. After that he strolled along the boulevard. It was cold and windswept. People hurried by, wrapped up in their coats, shrunk together in an effort to keep out of the cold, and their faces were pinched and careworn. It was icy underground in the cemetery at Montpersan among all those white tombstones. Philip felt lonely in the world and strangely homesick. He wanted company. At that hour Cronshaw would be working, and Clutton never welcomed visitors. Lawson was painting another portrait of Ruth Chalice and would not care to be disturbed. He made up his mind to go and see Flanagan. He found him painting, but delighted to throw up his work and talk. The studio was comfortable, for the American had more money than most of them, and warm. Flanagan set about making tea. Philip looked at the two heads that he was sending to the salon. 
"'It's awful cheek, my sending anything,' said Flanagan, "'but I don't care. I'm going to send. Do you think they're rotten?' "'Not so rotten as I should have expected,' said Philip. They showed, in fact, an astounding cleverness. The difficulties had been avoided with skill, and there was a dash about the way in which the paint was put on which was surprising and even attractive. Flanagan, without knowledge or technique, painted with the loose brush of a man who has spent a lifetime in the practice of the art. "'If one were forbidden to look at any picture for more than thirty seconds, you'd be a great master, Flanagan,' smiled Philip. "'These young people were not in the habit of spoiling one another with excessive flattery. We haven't got time in America to spend more than thirty seconds in looking at any picture,' laughed the other. Flanagan, though he was the most scatter-brained person in the world, had a tenderness of heart which was unexpected and charming. Whenever anyone was ill he installed himself as sick nurse. His gaiety was better than any medicine. Like many of his countrymen he had not the English dread of sentimentality which keeps so tight a hold on emotion, and, finding nothing absurd in the show of feeling, could offer an exuberant sympathy which was often grateful to his friends in distress. He saw that Philip was depressed by what he had gone through, and with unaffected kindliness set himself boisterously to cheer him up. He exaggerated the Americanisms which he knew always made the Englishman laugh, and poured out a breathless stream of conversation, whimsical, high-spirited, and jolly. In due course they went out to dinner, and afterwards to the Gate Montparson, which was Flanagan's favorite place of amusement. By the end of the evening he was in his most extravagant humor. He had drunk a good deal, but any inebriety from which he suffered was due much more to his own vivacity than to alcohol. He proposed that they should go to the Bal Bouillet, and Philip, feeling too tired to go to bed, willingly enough consented. They sat down at a table on the platform at the side, raised a little from the level of the floor, so that they could watch the dancing and drank a box. Presently Flanagan saw a friend and with a wild shout leaped over the barrier onto the space where they were dancing. Philip watched the people. Boulier was not the resort of fashion. It was Thursday night and the place was crowded. There were a number of students of the various faculties, but most of the men were clerks or assistants in shops. They wore their everyday clothes, ready-made tweeds or queer tail coats, and their hats for they had brought them in with them and when they danced there was no place to put them but their heads. Some of the women looked like servant-girls, and some were painted hussies, but for the most part they were shop-girls. They were poorly dressed in cheap imitation of the fashions on the other side of the river. The hussies were got up to resemble the music-hall artiste or the dancer who enjoyed notoriety at the moment. Their eyes were heavy with black and their cheeks impotently scarlet. The hall was lit by great white lights, low down, which emphasized the shadows on the faces. All the lines seemed to harden under it, and the colors were most crude. It was a sordid scene. Philip leaned over the rail, staring down, and he ceased to hear the music. They danced furiously. They danced round the room, slowly, talking very little, with all their attention given to the dance. The room was hot and their faces shone with sweat. It seemed to Philip that they had thrown off the guard which people wear on their expression, the homage to convention, and he saw them now as they really were. In that moment of abandon they were strangely animal. Some were foxy and some were wolf-like, and others had the long foolish face of sheep. Their skins were sallow from the unhealthy life they led and the poor food they ate. Their features were blunted by mean interests, and their little eyes were shifty and cunning. There was nothing of nobility in their bearing, and you felt that for all of them life was a long succession of petty concerns and sordid thoughts. The air was heavy with the musty smell of humanity. But they danced furiously as though impelled by some strange power within them, and it seemed to Philip that they were driven forward by a rage for enjoyment they were seeking desperately to escape from a world of horror. The desire for pleasure which Cronshaw said was the only motive of human action urged them blindly on, 
and the very vehemence of the desire seemed to rob it of all pleasure. They were hurried on by a great wind, helplessly, they knew not why, and they knew not whither. Fate seemed to tower above them, and they danced as though everlasting darkness were beneath their feet. Their silence was vaguely alarming. It was as if life terrified them and robbed them of power of speech so that the shriek which was in their hearts died at their throats. Their eyes were haggard and grim, and notwithstanding the beastly lust that disfigured them, and the meanness of their faces, and the cruelty notwithstanding the stupidness which was worst of all, the anguish of those fixed eyes made all that crowd terrible and pathetic. Philip loathed them, and yet his heart ached with the infinite pity which filled him. He took his coat from the cloakroom and went out into the bitter coldness of the night. End of chapter 49 Chapter 50 Philip could not get the unhappy event out of his head. What troubled him most was the uselessness of Fanny's effort. No one could have worked harder than she, nor with more sincerity. She believed in herself with all her heart, but it was plain that self-confidence meant very little. All his friends had it, Miguel O'Hura among the rest, and Philip was shocked by the contrast between the Spaniard's heroic endeavor and the triviality of the thing he attempted. The unhappiness of Philip's life at school had called up in him the power of self-analysis, and this vice, as subtle as drug-taking, had taken possession of him so that he had now a peculiar keenness in the dissection of his feelings. He could not help seeing that art affected him differently from others. A fine picture gave Lawson an immediate thrill. His appreciation was instinctive. Even Flanagan felt certain things which Philip was obliged to think out. His own appreciation was intellectual. He could not help thinking that if he had in him the artistic temperament, he hated the phrase but could discover no other, he would feel beauty in the emotional unreasoning way in which they did. He began to wonder whether he had anything more than a superficial cleverness of the hand which enabled him to copy objects with accuracy that was nothing. He had learned to despise technical dexterity. The important thing was to feel in terms of paint. Lawson painted in a certain way because it was his nature to, and through the imitativeness of a student sensitive to every influence, there pierced individuality. Philip looked at his own portrait of Ruth Chalice, and now that three months had passed he realized that it was no more than a servile copy of Lawson. He felt himself barren. He painted with the brain, and he could not help knowing that the only painting worth anything was done with the heart. He had very little money, barely sixteen hundred pounds, and it would be necessary for him to practice the severest economy. He could not count on earning anything for ten years. The history of painting was full of artists who had earned nothing at all he must resign himself to penury, and it was worth while if he produced work which was immortal, but he had a terrible fear that he would never be more than second-rate. Was it worth while for that to give up one's youth and the gaiety of life and the manifold chances of being? He knew the existence of foreign painters in Paris enough to see that the lives they led were narrowly provincial. He knew some who had dragged along for twenty years in the pursuit of a fame which always escaped them till they sunk into sordidness and alcoholism. Fanny's suicide had aroused memories, and Philip heard ghastly stories of the way in which one person or another had escaped from despair. He remembered the scornful advice which the master had given poor Fanny. It would have been well for her if she had taken it and given up an attempt which was hopeless. Philip finished his portrait of Miguel Ahura and made up his mind to send it to the Salon. Flanagan was sending two pictures, and he thought he could paint as well as Flanagan. He had worked so hard on the portrait that he could not help feeling it must have merit. It was true that when he looked at it he felt that there was something wrong, though he could not tell what. But when he was away from it his spirits went up and he was not dissatisfied. 
he sent it to the salon, and it was refused. He did not mind much, since he had done all he could to persuade himself that there was little chance that it would be taken, till Flanagan a few days later rushed in to tell Lawson and Philip that one of his pictures was accepted. With a blank face Philip offered his congratulations, and Flanagan was so busy congratulating himself that he did not catch the note of irony which Philip could not prevent from coming into his voice. Lawson, quicker-witted, observed it and looked at Philip curiously. His own picture was all right, he knew that a day or two before, and he was vaguely resentful of Philip's attitude, but he was surprised at the sudden question which Philip put him as soon as the American was gone. "'If you were in my place, would you chuck the whole thing?' "'What do you mean? I wonder if it's worth while being a second-rate painter. You see, in other things, if you're a doctor or if you're in business, it doesn't matter so much if you're mediocre. You make a living and you get along. But what is the good of turning out second-rate pictures?' Lawson was fond of Philip, and as soon as he had thought he was seriously distressed by the refusal of his picture, he set to console him. It was notorious that the Salon had refused pictures which were afterwards famous. It was the first time Philip had sent, and he must expect a rebuff. Flanagan's success was explicable. His picture was showy and superficial. It was just the sort of thing a languid jury would see merited. Philip grew impatient. It was humiliating that Lawson should think him capable of being seriously disturbed by so trivial a calamity and would not realize that his dejection was due to a deep-seated distrust of his powers. Of late Clutton had withdrawn himself somewhat from the group who took their meals at Gravier's and lived very much by himself. Flanagan said he was in love with a girl, but Clutton's austere countenance did not suggest passion, and Philip thought it more probable that he separated himself from his friends so that he might grow clear with the new ideas which were in him but that evening when the others had left the restaurant to go to a play and philip was sitting alone clutton came in and ordered dinner they began to talk and finding clutton more loquacious and less sardonic than usual philip determined to take advantage of his good humour i say i wish you'd come and look at my picture he said i'd like to know what you think of it no i won't do that why not asked philip reddening the request was one which they all made of one another, and no one ever thought of refusing. Clutton shrugged his shoulders. People ask you for criticism, but they only want praise. Besides, what's the good of criticism? What does it matter if your picture is good or bad? It matters to me. No, the only reason that one paints is that one can't help it. It's a function like any of the other functions of the body, only comparatively few people have got it one paints for oneself, otherwise one would commit suicide. Just think of it. You spend God knows how long trying to get something onto canvas, putting the sweat of your soul into it, and what is the result? Ten to one it will be refused at the salon. If it's accepted people glance at it for ten seconds as they pass. If you're lucky some ignorant fool will buy it and put it on his walls and look at it as little as he looks at his dining-room table. Criticism has nothing to do with the artist. It judges objectively, but the objective doesn't concern the artist. Clutton put his hands over his eyes so that he might concentrate his mind on what he wanted to say. The artist gets a peculiar sensation from something he sees and is impelled to express it, and he doesn't know why he can only express his feeling by lines and colors. It's like a musician he'll read a line or two and a certain combination of notes presents itself to him. He doesn't know why such and such words call forth in him such and such notes. They just do. And I'll tell you another reason why criticism is meaningless. A great painter forces the world to see nature as he sees it, but in the next generation another painter sees the world in another way, and then the public judges him not by himself but by his predecessor so the Barbizon people taught our fathers to look at trees in a certain manner, and when Monet came along and painted differently people said, but trees aren't like that. It never struck them that trees are exactly how a painter chooses to see them. We paint from within outwards, 
if we force our vision on the world it calls us great painters if we don't it ignores us but we are the same we don't attach any meaning to greatness or to smallness what happens to our work afterwards is unimportant we have got all we could out of it while we were doing it there was a pause while clutton with voracious appetite devoured the food that was set before him philip smoking a cheap cigar observed him closely the ruggedness of the head which looked as though it were carved from a stone refractory to the sculptor's chisel the rough mane of dark hair the great nose and the massive bones of the jaw suggested a man of strength and yet philip wondered whether perhaps the mask concealed a strange weakness clutton's refusal to show his work might be sheer vanity he could not bear the thought of any one's criticism and he would not expose himself to the chance of a refusal from the salon he wanted to be received as a master and would not risk comparisons with other work which might force him to diminish his own opinion of himself during the eighteen months philip had known him clutton had grown more harsh and bitter though he would not come out into the open and compete with his fellows he was indignant with the facile success of those who did he had no patience with lawson and the pair were no longer on the intimate terms upon which they had been when philip first knew them lawson's all right he said contemptuously he'll go back to england become a fashionable portrait painter earn ten thousand a year and be an a r a before he's forty portraits done by hand for the nobility and gentry philip too looked into the future and he saw clutton in twenty years bitter lonely savage and unknown still in paris for the life there had got into his bones ruling a small cynical with a savage tongue at war with himself and the world producing little in his increasing passion for perfection he could not reach and perhaps sinking at last into drunkenness of late philip had been captivated by an idea that since one had only one life it was important to make a success of it but he did not count success by the acquiring of money or the achieving of fame he did not quite know yet what he meant by it perhaps variety of experience and the making the most of his abilities it was plain anyway that the life which clutton seemed destined to was failure its only justification would be the painting of imperishable masterpieces he recollected cronshaw's whimsical metaphor of the persian carpet he had thought of it often but cronshaw with his fawny like humour had refused to make his meaning clear he repeated that it had none unless one discovered it for oneself it was this desire to make a success of life which was at the bottom of philip's uncertainty about continuing his artistic career but clutton began to talk again do you remember my telling you about that chap i met in brittany i saw him the other day here he's just off to tahiti he was broke to the world he was a brasseur de fer a stockbroker i suppose you call it in english and he had a wife and family and he was earning a large income he chucked it all to become a painter he just went off and settled down in brittany and began to paint he hadn't got any money and did the next best thing to starving and what about his wife and family asked philip oh he dropped them he left them to starve on their own account it sounds a pretty low-down thing to do oh my dear fellow if you want to be a gentleman you must give up being an artist they've got nothing to do with one another you hear of men painting pot-boilers to keep an aged mother well it shows they're excellent sons but it's no excuse for bad work they're only tradesmen an artist would let his mother go to the workhouse there's a writer i know over here who told me that his wife died in childbirth he was in love with her and he was mad with grief but as he sat at the bedside watching her die he found himself making mental notes of how she looked and what she said and the things he was feeling gentlemanly wasn't it but is your friend a good painter asked philip no not yet he paints just like pizarro he hasn't found himself but he's got a sense of color and a sense of decoration but that isn't the question it's the feeling and that he's got he's behaved like a perfect cad to his wife and children he's always behaving like a perfect cad the way he treats the people who've helped him 
and sometimes he's been saved from starvation merely by the kindness of his friends, is simply beastly. He just happens to be a great artist. Philip pondered over the man who was willing to sacrifice everything, comfort, home, money, love, honor, duty, for the sake of getting on to canvas with paint the emotion which the world gave him. It was magnificent, and yet his courage failed him. Thinking of Cronshaw recalled to him the fact that he had not seen him for a week, and so when Clutton left him he wandered along to the café in which he was certain to find the writer. During the first few months of his stay in Paris Philip had accepted as gospel all that Cronshaw said, but Philip had a practical outlook, and he grew impatient with the theories which resulted in no action. Cronshaw's slim bundle of poetry did not seem a substantial result for a life which was sordid. Philip could not wrench out of his nature the instincts of the middle class from which he came, and the penury, the hack-work which Cronshaw did to keep body and soul together, the monotony of existence between the slovenly attic and the café table jarred with his respectability. Cronshaw was astute enough to know that the young man disapproved of him, and he attacked his philistinism with an irony which was sometimes playful but often very keen. "'You're a tradesman,' he told Philip. "'You want to invest life in consoles so that it shall bring you in a safe three per cent. I'm a spendthrift. I run through my capital. I shall spend my last penny with my last heartbeat. The metaphor irritated Philip because it assumed for the speaker a romantic attitude and cast a slur upon the position which Philip instinctively felt had more to say for it than he could think of at the moment. But this evening Philip, undecided, wanted to talk about himself. Fortunately it was late already, and Cronshaw's pile of saucers on the table, each indicating a drink, suggested that he was prepared to take an independent view of things in general. "'I wonder if you'd give me some advice,' said Philip suddenly. "'You won't take it, will you?' Philip shrugged his shoulders impatiently. "'I don't believe I shall ever do much good as a painter. I don't see any use in being second-rate. I'm thinking of chucking it. Why shouldn't you?' Philip hesitated for an instant. "'I suppose I like the life.' A change came over Cronshaw's placid round face. The corners of the mouth were suddenly depressed, the eyes sunk dully in their orbits. He seemed to become strangely bowed and old. This, he cried, looking round the café in which they sat. His voice really trembled a little. If you can get out of it, do while there's time. Philip stared at him with astonishment, but the sight of emotion always made him feel shy, and he dropped his eyes. He knew that he was looking upon the tragedy of failure. There was silence. Philip thought that Cronshaw was looking upon his own life and perhaps he considered his youth with its bright hopes and the disappointments which wore out the radiancy, the wretched monotony of pleasure, and the black future. Philip's eyes rested on the little pile of saucers, and he knew that Cronshaw's were on them too. End of chapter 50 Chapter 51 Two months passed. It seemed to Philip, brooding over these matters, that in the true painters, writers, musicians, there was a power which drove them to such complete absorption in their work as to make it inevitable for them to subordinate life to art. Succumbing to an influence they never realized, they were merely dupes of the instinct that possessed them, and life slipped through their fingers unlived. But he had a feeling that life was to be lived rather than portrayed, and he wanted to search out the various experiences of it, and wring from each moment all the emotion that it offered. He made up his mind at length to take a certain step and abide by the result, and, having made up his mind, he determined to take the step at once. Luckily enough, the next morning was one of Juanet's days, and he resolved to ask him, point-blank, whether it was worth his while to go on with the study of art. He had never forgotten the master's brutal advice to Fanny Price. It had been sound. Philip could never get Fanny entirely out of his head. The studio seemed strange without her, and now and then the gesture of one of the women working there, or a tone of a voice, would give him a sudden start, reminding him of her, 
Her presence was more noticeable now she was dead than it had ever been during her life, and he often dreamed of her at night, waking with a cry of terror. It was horrible to think of all the suffering she must have endured. Philip knew that on the day Soinet came to the studio he lunched at a little restaurant in the Rue d'Odessa, and he hurried his own meal so that he could go and wait outside till the painter came out. Philip walked up and down the crowded street, and at last saw Monsieur Foinet walking with bent head towards him. Philip was very nervous, but he forced himself to go up to him. Pardon, monsieur, I should like to speak to you for one moment. Foinet gave him a rapid glance, recognized him, but did not smile the greeting. Speak, he said. I've been working here nearly two years now under you. I wanted to ask you to tell me frankly if you think it's worth while for me to continue. Philip's voice was trembling a little. Foinet walked on without looking up. Philip, watching his face, saw no trace of expression upon it. I don't understand. I'm very poor. If I have no talent, I would sooner do something else. Don't you know if you have talent? All my friends know they have talent, but I am aware some of them are mistaken. Juanet's bitter mouth outlined the shadow of a smile, and he asked, Do you live near here? Philip told him where his studio was. Juanet turned round. Let us go there. You shall show me your work. Now? cried Philip. Why not? Philip had nothing to say. He walked silently by the master's side. He felt horribly sick. It had never struck him that Foinet would wish to see his things there and then. He meant so that he might have time to prepare himself, to ask him if he would mind coming at some future date, or whether he might bring them to Foinet's studio. He was trembling with anxiety. In his heart he hoped that Foinet would look at his picture, and that rare smile would come into his face, and he would shake Philip's hand and say, Pasma, go on, my lad. You have talent, real talent. Philip's heart swelled at the thought. It was such a relief, such a joy. Now he could go on with courage. And what did hardship matter, privation, and disappointment, if he arrived at last? He had worked very hard. It would be too cruel if all that industry were futile. And then, with a start, he remembered that he had heard Fanny Price say just that. They arrived at the house and Philip was seized with fear. If he had dared he would have asked Foinet to go away. He did not want to know the truth. They went in and the concierge handed him a letter as they passed. He glanced at the envelope and recognized his uncle's handwriting. Foinet followed him up the stairs. Philip could think of nothing to say. Foinet was mute and the silence got on his nerves. The professor sat down and Philip, without a word, placed before him the pictures which the Salon had rejected. Foinet nodded, but did not speak. Then Philip showed him the two portraits he had made of Rue Chalice, two or three landscapes which he had painted at Moray, and a number of sketches. That's all, he said presently with a nervous laugh. Monsieur Foinet rolled himself a cigarette and lit it. You have very little private means? he asked at last. Very little, answered Philip, with a sudden feeling of cold at his heart. Not enough to live on. There is nothing so degrading as the constant anxiety about one's means of livelihood. I have nothing but contempt for the people who despise money. They are hypocrites or fools. Money is like a sixth sense without which you cannot make a complete use of the other five. Without an adequate income half the possibilities of life are shut off. The only thing to be careful about is that you do not pay more than a shilling for the shilling you earn. You will hear people say that poverty is the best spur to an artist. They have never felt the iron of it in their flesh. They do not know how mean it makes you. It exposes you to endless humiliation. It cuts your wings. It eats into your soul like a cancer. It is not wealth one asks for, but just enough to preserve one's dignity to work unhampered, to be generous, frank, and independent. I pity with all my heart the artist, whether he writes or paints, who is entirely dependent for subsistence upon his art. Philip quietly put away the various things which he had shown. 
"'I'm afraid that sounds as if you didn't think I had much chance.' Master Foinet slightly shrugged his shoulders. "'You have a certain manual dexterity. With hard work and perseverance there is no reason why you should not become a careful, not incompetent painter. You would find hundreds who painted worse than you, hundreds who painted as well. I see no talent in anything you have shown me. I see industry and intelligence. You will never be anything but mediocre." Philip obliged himself to answer quite steadily. "'I'm very grateful to you for having taken so much trouble. I can't thank you enough.' Monsieur Foinet got up and made as if to go, but he changed his mind and, stopping, put his hand on Philip's shoulder. "'But if you were to ask me my advice, I should say, take your courage in both hands and try your luck at something else. It sounds very hard, but let me tell you this. I would give all I have in the world if someone had given me that advice when I was your age, and I had taken it. Philip looked up at him with surprise. The master forced his lips into a smile, but his eyes remained grave and sad. It is cruel to discover one's mediocrity only when it is too late. It does not improve the temper. He gave a little laugh as he said the last words, and quickly walked out of the room. Philip mechanically took up the letter from his uncle. The sight of his handwriting made him anxious, for it was his aunt who always wrote to him. She had been ill for the last three months, and he had offered to go over to England and see her, but she, fearing it would interfere with his work, had refused. She did not want him to put himself to inconvenience. She said she would wait till August, and then she hoped he would come and stay at the vicarage for two or three weeks. If by any chance she grew worse, she would let him know, since she did not wish to die without seeing him again. If his uncle wrote to him, it must be because she was too ill to hold a pen. Philip opened the letter. It ran as follows. My dear Philip, I regret to inform you that your dear aunt departed this life early this morning. She died very suddenly but quite peacefully. The change for the worse was so rapid that we had no time to send for you. She was fully prepared for the end and entered into rest with the complete assurance of a blessed resurrection and with resignation to the divine will of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Your aunt would have liked you to be present at the funeral, so I trust you will come as soon as you can. There is naturally a great deal of work thrown upon my shoulders, and I am very much upset. I trust that you will be able to do everything for me. Your affectionate uncle, William Carey. End of chapter 51 Chapter 52 Next day Philip arrived at Blackstable. Since the death of his mother he had never lost anyone closely connected with him. His aunt's death shocked him and filled him also with a curious fear. He felt for the first time his own mortality. He could not realize what life would be for his uncle without the constant companionship of the woman who had loved and tended him for forty years. He expected to find him broken down with hopeless grief. He dreaded the first meeting. He knew that he could say nothing which would be of use. He rehearsed to himself a number of apposite speeches. He entered the vicarage by the side door and went into the dining-room. Uncle William was reading the paper. "'Your train was late,' he said, looking up. Philip was prepared to give way to his emotion, but the matter-of-fact reception startled him. His uncle, subdued but calm, handed him the paper. "'There's a very nice little paragraph about her in the Blackstable Times,' he said. Philip read it mechanically. "'Would you like to come up and see her?' Philip nodded, and together they walked upstairs. Aunt Louisa was lying in the middle of the large bed with flowers all round her. "'Would you like to say a short prayer?' said the vicar. He sank on his knees, and because it was expected of him, Philip followed his example. He looked at the little shriveled face. He was only conscious of one emotion. What a wasted life! In a minute Mr. Carey gave a cough and stood up. He pointed to a wreath at the foot of the bed. "'That's from the squire,' he said. He spoke in a low voice, as though he were in church, 
but one felt that, as a clergyman, he found himself quite at home. I expect tea is ready. They went down again to the dining room. The drawn blinds gave a lugubrious aspect. The vicar sat at the end of the table at which his wife had always sat and poured out the tea with ceremony. Philip could not help feeling that neither of them should have been able to eat anything, but when he saw that his uncle's appetite was unimpaired he fell to with his usual heartiness. They did not speak for a while. Philip set himself to eat an excellent cake with the air of grief which he felt was decent. "'Things have changed a great deal since I was a curate,' said the vicar presently. "'In my young days the mourners used always to be given a pair of black gloves and a piece of black silk for their hats. Poor Louisa used to make the silk into dresses. She always said that twelve funerals gave her a new dress. Then he told Philip who had sent Reese. There were twenty-four of them already. When Mrs. Rawlingson, wife of the vicar at Fern, had died, she had had thirty-two, but probably a good many more would come the next day. The funeral would start at eleven o'clock from the vicarage, and they should beat Mrs. Rawlingson easily. Louisa never liked Mrs. Rawlingson. I shall take the funeral myself. I promised Louisa I would never let anyone else bury her. Philip looked at his uncle with disapproval when he took a second piece of cake. Under the circumstances he could not help thinking it greedy. Mary Ann certainly makes capital cakes. I'm afraid no one else will make such good ones. She's not going, cried Philip with astonishment. Mary Ann had been at the vicarage ever since he could remember. She never forgot his birthday, but made a point always of sending him a trifle, absurd but touching. He had a real affection for her. Yes, answered Mr. Carey, I don't think it would do to have a single woman in the house. But good heavens, she must be over forty. Yes, I think she is. But she's been rather troublesome lately. She's been inclined to take too much on herself, and I thought this was a very good opportunity to give her notice. It's certainly one which isn't likely to recur, said Philip. He took out a cigarette, but his uncle prevented him from lighting it. Not till after the funeral, Philip, he said gently. All right, said Philip. It wouldn't be quite respectful to smoke in the house so long as your poor Aunt Louisa is upstairs. Josiah Graves, churchwarden and manager of the bank, came back to dinner at the vicarage after the funeral. The blinds had been drawn up, and Philip, against his will, felt a curious sensation of relief. The body in the house had made him uncomfortable. In life the poor woman had been all that was kind and gentle, and yet, when she lay upstairs in her bedroom, cold and stark, it seemed as though she cast upon the survivors a baleful influence. The thought horrified Philip. He found himself alone for a minute or two in the dining room with the churchwarden. "'I hope you'll be able to stay with your uncle a while,' he said. "'I don't think he ought to be left alone just yet.' "'I haven't made any plans,' answered Philip. "'If he wants me, I shall be very pleased to stay.' By way of cheering the bereaved husband, the churchwarden during dinner talked of a recent fire at Blackstable which had partly destroyed the Wesleyan chapel. "'I hear they weren't insured,' he said with a little smile. "'That won't make any difference,' said the vicar. They'll get as much money as they want to rebuild. Chapel people are always ready to give money. I see that Holden sent a wreath. Holden was the dissenting minister, and though for Christ's sake who died for both of them, Mr. Carey nodded to him in the street, he did not speak to him. I think it was very pushing, he remarked. There were forty-one wreaths. Yours was beautiful. Philip and I admired it very much. Don't mention it, said the banker. He had noticed with satisfaction that it was larger than anyone else's. It had looked very well. They began to discuss the people who attended the funeral. Shops had been closed for it, and the church warden took out of his pocket the notice which had been printed. Owing to the funeral of Mrs. Carey, this establishment will not be opened till one o'clock. It was my idea, he said. I think it was very nice of them to close, said the vicar. Poor Louisa! would have appreciated that. Philip ate his dinner. Mary Ann had treated the day as Sunday, and they had roast chicken and a gooseberry tart. "'I suppose you hadn't thought about a tombstone yet,' said the churchwarden. "'Yes, I have. 
I thought of a plain stone cross. Louisa was always against ostentation. I don't think one can do much better than a cross. If you're thinking of a text, what do you say to, with Christ, which is far better? The vicar pursed his lips. It was just like Bismarck to try and settle everything himself. He did not like that text. It seemed to cast an aspersion on himself. I don't think I should put it that way. I much prefer, the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Oh, do you? That always seems to me a little indifferent. The vicar answered with some acidity, and Mr. Graves replied in a tone which the widower thought too authoritative for the occasion. Things were going rather far if he could not choose his own text for his own wife's tombstone. There was a pause, and then the conversation drifted to parish matters. Philip went into the garden to smoke his pipe. He sat on a bench and suddenly began to laugh hysterically. A few days later his uncle expressed the hope that he would spend the next few weeks at Blackstable. "'Yes, that will suit me very well,' said Philip. "'I suppose it'll do if you go back to Paris in September.' Philip did not reply. He had thought much of what Poinet said to him, but he was still so undecided that he did not wish to speak of the future. There would be something fine in giving up art because he was convinced that he could not excel, but unfortunately it would seem so only to himself. To others it would be an admission of defeat, and he did not want to confess that he was beaten. He was an obstinate fellow, and the suspicion that his talent did not lie in one direction made him inclined to force circumstances and aim notwithstanding precisely in that direction. He could not bear that his friends should laugh at him. This might have prevented him from ever taking the definite step of abandoning the study of painting, but the different environment made him on a sudden see things differently. Like many another, he discovered that crossing the channel makes things which had seemed important singularly futile. The life which had been so charming that he could not bear to leave it now seemed inept. He was seized with a distaste for the cafés, the restaurants with their ill-cooked food, the shabby way in which they all lived. He did not care any more what his friends thought about him. Cronshaw with his rhetoric, Mrs. Otter with her respectability, Ruth Chalice with her affectations, Lawson and Clutton with their quarrels. He felt a revulsion from them all. He wrote to Lawson and asked him to send over all his belongings. A week later they arrived. When he unpacked his canvases he found himself able to examine his work without emotion. He noticed the fact with interest. His uncle was anxious to see his pictures. Though he had so greatly disapproved of Philip's desire to go to Paris, he accepted the situation now with equanimity. He was interested in the life of students and constantly put Philip questions about it. He was, in fact, a little proud of him because he was a painter, and when people were present made attempts to draw him out. He looked eagerly at the studies of models which Philip showed him. Philip set before him his portrait of Miguel Ahura. "'Why did you paint him?' asked Mr. Carey. "'Oh, I wanted a model, and his head interested me. As you haven't got anything to do here, I wonder if you don't paint me. It would bore you to sit. I think I should like it. We must see about it. Philip was amused at his uncle's vanity. It was clear that he was dying to have his portrait painted. To get something for nothing was a chance not to be missed. For two or three days he threw out little hints. He reproached Philip for laziness, asked him when he was going to start work, and finally began telling everyone he met that Philip was going to paint him. At last there came a rainy day, and after breakfast Mr. Carey said to Philip, "'Now, what do you say to starting on my portrait this morning?' Philip put down the book he was reading and leaned back in his chair. "'I've given up painting,' he said. "'Why?' asked his uncle in astonishment. "'I don't think there's much object in being a second-rate painter, and I came to the conclusion that I should never be anything else.' you surprise me. Before you went to Paris you were quite certain that you were a genius. I was mistaken, said Philip. I should have thought now you'd taken up a profession you'd have the pride to stick to it. 
it seems to me that what you lack is perseverance. Philip was a little annoyed that his uncle did not even see how truly heroic his determination was. A rolling stone gathers no moss, proceeded the clergyman. Philip hated that proverb above all, and it seemed to him perfectly meaningless. His uncle had repeated it often during the arguments which had preceded his departure from business. Apparently it recalled that occasion to his guardian. You're no longer a boy, you know. You must begin to think of settling down. First you insist on becoming a chartered accountant, and then you get tired of that and you want to become a painter, and now, if you please, you change your mind again. It points to... He hesitated for a moment to consider what defects of character exactly it indicated, and Philip finished the sentence. Irresolution, incompetence, want of foresight, and lack of determination. The vicar looked up at his nephew quickly to see whether he was laughing at him. Philip's face was serious, but there was a twinkle in his eyes which irritated him. Philip should really be getting more serious. He felt it right to give him a rap over the knuckles. Your money matters have nothing to do with me now. You're your own master, but I think you should remember that your money won't last forever, and the unlucky deformity you have doesn't exactly make it easier for you to earn your living. Philip knew by now that whenever anyone was angry with him his first thought was to say something about his club foot. His estimate of the human race was determined by the fact that scarcely anyone failed to resist the temptation, but he had trained himself not to show any sign that the reminder wounded him. He had even acquired control over the blushing which in his boyhood had been one of his torments. As you justly remark, he answered, my money matters have nothing to do with you, and I am my own master. At all events you will do me the justice to acknowledge that I was justified in my opposition when you made up your mind to become an art student. I don't know so much about that. I dare say one profits more by the mistakes one makes off one's own bat than by doing the right thing on somebody else's advice. I've had my fling, and I don't mind settling down now. What at? Philip was not prepared for the question, since in fact he had not made up his mind. He had thought of a dozen callings. The most suitable thing you could do is enter your father's profession and become a doctor. Oddly enough, that is precisely what I intend. He had thought of doctoring among other things, chiefly because it was an occupation which seemed to give a good deal of personal freedom, and his experience of life at an office had made him determine never to have anything more to do with one. His answer to the vicar slipped out almost unawares, because it was in the nature of a repartee. It amused him to make up his mind in that accidental way, and he resolved then and there to enter his father's old hospital in the autumn. Then your two years in Paris may be regarded as so much wasted time? I don't know about that. I had a very jolly two years, and I learned one or two useful things. What? Philip reflected for an instant, and his answer was not devoid of a gentle desire to annoy. I learned to look at hands which I'd never looked at before, and instead of just looking at houses and trees, I learned to look at houses and trees against the sky. And I learned also that shadows are not black, but colored. I suppose you think you're very clever. I think your flippancy is quite inane. End of chapter 52 Recording by Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan Chapter 53 Taking the paper with him, Mr. Carey retired to his study. Philip changed his chair for that in which his uncle had been sitting. It was the only comfortable one in the room, and looked out of the window at the pouring rain. Even in that sad weather there was something restful about the green fields that stretched to the horizon. There was an intimate charm in the landscape which he did not remember ever to have noticed before. Two years in France had opened his eyes to the beauty of his own countryside. He thought with a smile of his uncle's remark. It was lucky that the turn of his mind tended to flippancy. He had begun to realize what a great loss he had sustained in the death of his father and mother. 
that was one of the differences in his life which prevented him from seeing things in the same way as other people. The love of parents for their children is the only emotion which is quite disinterested. Among strangers he had grown as best as he could, but he had seldom been used with patience or forbearance. He prided himself on his self-control. It had been whipped into him by the mockery of his fellows. Then they called him cynical and callous. He had acquired calmness of demeanor, and under most circumstances an unruffled exterior, so that now he could not show his feelings. People told him he was unemotional, but he knew that he was at the mercy of his emotions. An accidental kindness touched him so much that sometimes he did not venture to speak in order not to betray the unsteadiness of his voice. He remembered the bitterness of his life at school, the humiliation which he had endured, the banter which had made him morbidly afraid of making himself ridiculous, and he remembered the loneliness he had felt since, faced with the world, the disillusion and the disappointment caused by the difference between what it promised to his active imagination and what it gave. But notwithstanding he was able to look at himself from the outside and smile with amusement. "'By Jove, if I weren't flippant I should hang myself,' he thought cheerfully. His mind went back to the answer he had given his uncle when he asked him what he had learnt in Paris. He had learnt a good deal more than he told him. A conversation with Cronshaw had stuck in his memory, and one phrase he had used, a commonplace one enough, had set his brain working. "'My dear fellow,' Cronshaw said, "'there's no such thing as abstract morality.' When Philip ceased to believe in Christianity he felt that a great weight was taken from his shoulders. Casting off the responsibility which weighed down every action, when every action was infinitely important for the welfare of his immortal soul, he experienced a vivid sense of liberty. But he knew now that this was an illusion. When he put away the religion in which he had been brought up, he had kept unimpaired the morality which was part and parcel of it. He made up his mind, therefore, to think things out for himself. He determined to be swayed by no prejudices. He swept away the virtues and the vices, the established laws of good and evil, with the idea of finding out the rules of life for himself. He did not know whether rules were necessary at all. That was one of the things he wanted to discover. Clearly much that seemed valid seemed so only because he had been taught it from his earliest youth. He had read a number of books, but they did not help him much, for they were based on the morality of Christianity, and even the writers who emphasized the fact that they did not believe in it were never satisfied till they had framed a system of ethics in accordance with that of the Sermon on the Mount. It seemed hardly worth while to read a long volume in order to learn that you ought to behave exactly like everybody else. Philip wanted to find out how he ought to behave and he thought he could prevent himself from being influenced by the opinions that surrounded him. But meanwhile he had to go on living, and until he formed a theory of conduct he made himself a provisional rule. Follow your inclinations with due regard to the policeman round the corner. He thought the best thing he had gained in Paris was a complete liberty of spirit, and he felt himself at last absolutely free. In a desultory way he had read a good deal of philosophy, and he looked forward with delight to the leisure of the next few months. He began to read at haphazard. He entered upon each system with a little thrill of excitement, expecting to find in each some guide by which he could rule his conduct. He felt himself like a traveller in unknown countries, and as he pushed forward the enterprise fascinated him. He read emotionally, as other men read pure literature and his heart leaped as he discovered in noble words what himself had obscurely felt. His mind was concrete and moved with difficulty in regions of the abstract, but even when he could not follow the reasoning it gave him a curious pleasure to follow the tortuosities of thoughts that threaded their nimble way on the edge of the incomprehensible. Sometimes great philosophers seemed to have nothing to say to him, but at others he recognized a mind with which he felt himself at home. He was like the explorer in Central Africa who comes suddenly upon wide uplands, with great trees in them and stretches of meadow, so that he might fancy himself in an English park. 
he delighted in the robust common sense of thomas hobbs spinoza filled him with awe he had never before come in contact with a mind so noble so unapproachable and austere it reminded him of that statue by rodin l'age de han which he passionately admired and then there was hume the scepticism of that charming philosopher touched a kindred note in philip and reveling in the lucid style which seemed able to put complicated thought into simple words musical and measured he read as he might have read a novel a smile of pleasure on his lips but in none could he find exactly what he wanted he had read somewhere that every man was born a platonist an aristotelian a stoic or an epicurean and the history of george henry lewes besides telling you that philosophy was all moonshine was there to show that the thought of each philosopher was inseparably connected with the man he was when you knew that you could guess to a great extent the philosophy he wrote it looked as though you did not act in a certain way because you thought in a certain way but rather that you thought in a certain way because you were made in a certain way truth had nothing to do with it there was no such thing as truth each man was his own philosopher and the elaborate systems which the great men of the past had composed were only valid for the writers the thing then was to discover what one was and one system of philosophy would devise itself it seemed to philip that there were three things to find out man's relation to the world he lives in man's relation with the men among whom he lives and finally man's relation to himself he made an elaborate plan of study the advantage of living abroad is that coming in contact with the manners and customs of the people among whom you live you observe them from the outside and see that they have not the necessity which those who practice them believe you cannot fail to discover that the beliefs which to you are self-evident to the foreigner are absurd the year in germany the long stay in paris had prepared philip to receive the sceptical teaching which came to him now with such a feeling of relief he saw that nothing was good and nothing was evil things were merely adapted to an end he read the origin of species it seemed to offer an explanation of much that troubled him he was like an explorer now who has reasoned that certain natural features must be present themselves and beating up a broad river finds here the tributary that he expected there the fertile populated plains and further on the mountains when some great discovery is made the world is surprised afterwards that it was not accepted at once and even on those who acknowledge its truth the effect is unimportant the first readers of the origin of species accepted it with their reason but their emotions which are the ground of conduct were untouched philip was born a generation after this great book was published and much that horrified its contemporaries had passed into the feeling of the time so that he was able to accept it with a joyful heart he was intensely moved by the grandeur of the struggle for life and the ethical rule which it suggested seemed to fit in with his predispositions he said to himself that might was right society stood on one side an organism with its own laws of growth and self-preservation while the individual stood on the other the actions which were to the advantage of society it termed virtuous and those which were not it called vicious good and evil meant nothing more than that sin was a prejudice from which the free man should rid himself society had three arms in its contest with the individual laws public opinion and conscience the first two could be met by guile guile is the only weapon of the weak against the strong common opinion put the matter well when it stated that sin consisted in being found out but conscience was the traitor within the gates it fought in each heart the battle of society and caused the individual to throw himself a wanton sacrifice to the prosperity of his enemy for it was clear that the two were irreconcilable the state and the individual conscience of himself that uses the individual for its own ends trampling upon him if he thwarts it rewarding him with medals pensions honors when he serves it faithfully this strong only in his independence threads his way through the state for convenience sake paying in money or service for certain benefits but with no sense of obligation 
and, indifferent to the rewards, asks only to be left alone. He is the independent traveller who uses Cook's tickets because they save trouble, but looks with good-humoured contempt on the personally conducted parties. The free man can do no wrong. He does everything he likes, if he can. His power is the only measure of his morality. He recognizes the laws of the state and he can break them without sense of sin, but if he is punished he accepts the punishment without rancor. Society has the power. But if for the individual there was no right or wrong, then it seemed to Philip that conscience lost its power. It was with a cry of triumph that he seized the knave and flung him from his breast, but he was no nearer to the meaning of life than he had been before. Why the world was there and what men had come into existence for at all was as inexplicable as ever. Surely there must be some reason. He thought of Cronshaw's parable of the Persian carpet. He offered it as a solution of the riddle, and mysteriously he stated that it was no answer at all unless you found it out for yourself. "'I wonder what the devil he meant,' Philip smiled. And so, on the last day of September, eager to put into practice all these new theories of life, Philip, with sixteen hundred pounds and his club foot, set out for a second time to London to make his third start in life. Chapter 54 The examination Philip had passed before he was articled to a chartered accountant was sufficient qualification for him to enter a medical school. He chose St. Luke's because his father had been a student there, and before the end of the summer session had gone up to London for a day in order to see the secretary. He got a list of rooms from him and took lodgings in a dingy house which had the advantage of being within two minutes' walk of the hospital. "'You'll have to arrange about a part to dissect,' the secretary told him. "'You'd better start on a leg. They generally do. They seem to think it easier.' Philip found that his first lecture was in anatomy at eleven, and about half-past ten he limped across the road and a little nervously made his way to the medical school. Just inside the door a number of notices were pinned up, lists of lectures, football fixtures, and the like, and these he looked at idly, trying to seem at his ease. Young men and boys dribbled in and looked for letters in the rack, chatted with one another, and passed downstairs to the basement in which was the student's reading-room. Philip saw several fellows with a desultory, timid look dawdling around and surmised that, like himself, they were there for the first time. When he had exhausted the notices he saw a glass door which led into what was apparently a museum, and having still twenty minutes to spare he walked in. It was a collection of pathological specimens. Presently a boy of about eighteen came up to him. "'I say, are you first year?' he said. "'Yes,' answered Philip. Where's the lecture room, do you know? It's getting on for eleven. We'd better try to find it. They walked out of the museum into a long dark corridor with the walls painted in two shades of red, and other use walking along suggested the way to them. They came to a door marked Anatomy Theatre. Philip found that there were a good many people already there. The seats were arranged in tiers, and just as Philip entered, an attendant came in put a glass of water on the table in the well of the lecture-room, and then brought in a pelvis and two thigh-bones, right and left. More men entered and took their seats, and by eleven the theatre was fairly full. There were about sixty students. For the most part they were a good deal younger than Philip, smooth-faced boys of eighteen, but there were a few who were older than he. He noticed one tall man with a fierce red moustache, who might have been thirty, another little fellow with black hair only a year or two younger, and then there was one man with spectacles and a beard which was quite grey. The lecturer came in, Mr. Cameron, a handsome man with white hair and clean-cut features. He called out the long list of names. Then he made a little speech. He spoke in a pleasant voice with well-chosen words, and he seemed to take a discreet pleasure in their careful arrangement. He suggested one or two books which they might buy and advised the purchase of a skeleton. He spoke of anatomy with enthusiasm. It was essential to the study of surgery. A knowledge of it added to the appreciation of art. Philip pricked up his ears. He heard later that Mr. Cameron lectured also to the students at the Royal Academy. He had lived many years in Japan with a post at the University of Tokyo, 
and he flattered himself on his appreciation of the beautiful. "'You will have to learn many tedious things,' he finished with an indulgent smile, "'which you will forget the moment you have passed your final examination. But in anatomy it is better to have learned and lost than never to have learned at all.' He took up the pelvis which was lying on the table and began to describe it. He spoke well and clearly. At the end of the lecture the boy who had spoken to Philip in the pathological museum and sat next to him in the theatre suggested that they should go to the dissecting room. Philip and he walked along the corridor again, and an attendant told them where it was. As soon as they entered Philip understood what the acrid smell was which he had noticed in the passage. He lit a pipe. The attendant gave a short laugh. "'You'll soon get used to the smell. I don't notice it myself.' He asked Philip's name and looked at a list on the board. "'You've got a leg, number four. Philip saw that another name was bracketed with his own. "'What's the meaning of that?' he asked. "'We're very short of bodies just now. We've had to put two on each part.' The dissecting room was a large apartment painted like the corridors, the upper part a rich salmon, and the dado a dark terracotta. At regular intervals down the long sides of the room, at right angles with the wall, were iron slabs, grooved like meat dishes, and on each lay a body. Most of them were men. They were very dark from the preservative in which they had been kept, and the skin had almost the look of leather. They were extremely emaciated. The attendant took Philip up to one of the slabs. A youth was standing by it. "'Is your name Carrie?' he asked. "'Yes.' "'Oh, then we've got this leg together.' "'It's lucky it's a man, isn't it?' "'Why?' asked Philip. "'They generally always like a male better,' said the attendant. "'A female's liable to have a lot of fat about her.' Philip looked at the body. The arms and legs were so thin that there was no shape in them, and the ribs stood out so that the skin over them was tense. A man of about forty-five with a thin gray beard and on his skull scanty colorless hair. The eyes were closed and the lower jaw sunken. Philip could not feel that this had ever been a man, and yet in the row of them there was something terrible and ghastly. "'I thought I'd start it too,' said the young man who was dissecting with Philip. "'All right, I'll be here then.' He had bought the day before the case of instruments which was needful, and now he was given a locker. He looked at the boy who had accompanied him into the dissecting room and saw that he was white. "'Make you feel rotten?' Philip asked him. I've never seen anyone dead before. They walked along the corridor till they came to the entrance of the school. Philip remembered Fanny Price. She was the first dead person he had ever seen, and he remembered how strangely it had affected him. There was an immeasurable distance between the quick and the dead. They did not seem to belong to the same species, and it was strange to think that but a little while before they had spoken and moved and eaten and laughed. There was something horrible about the dead, and you could imagine that they might cast an evil influence on the living. "'What do you say to having something to eat?' said his new friend to Philip. They went down into the basement, where there was a dark room fitted up as a restaurant, and here the students were able to get the same sort of fare as they might have at an air raid at bread shop. While they ate, Philip had a scone and butter and a cup of chocolate, he discovered that his companion was called Dunsford. He was a fresh-complexioned lad, with pleasant blue eyes and curly dark hair, large-limbed, slow of speech and movement. He had just come from Clifton. "'Are you taking the conjoint?' he asked Philip. "'Yes, I want to get qualified as soon as I can. I'm taking it too, but I shall take the FRCS afterwards. I'm going in for surgery.' Most of the students took the curriculum of the conjoint board of the College of Surgeons and the College of Physicians but the more ambitious or the more industrious added to this the longer studies which led to a degree from the university of london when philip went to st luke's changes had recently been made in the regulations and the course took five years instead of four as it had done for those who registered before the autumn of eighteen ninety two dunsford was well up in his plans and told philip the usual course of events the first conjoint examination consisted of biology, anatomy, and chemistry, but it could be taken in sections, and most fellows took their biology three months after entering the school. This science had been recently added to the list of subjects upon which the student was obliged to inform himself, 
but the amount of knowledge required was very small. When Philip went back to the dissecting room he was a few minutes late since he had forgotten to buy the loose sleeves which they wore to protect their shirts, and he found a number of men already working. His partner had started on the minute and was busy dissecting out cutaneous nerves. Two others were engaged on the second leg, and more were occupied with the arms. "'You don't mind my having started?' "'That's all right. Fire away,' said Philip. He took the book, open at a diagram of the dissected part, and looked at what they had to find. "'You're rather a dab at this,' said Philip. "'Oh, I've done a good deal of dissecting before. Animals, you know, for the pre -side. There was a certain amount of conversation over the dissecting table, partly about the work, partly about the prospects of the football season, the demonstrators, and the lectures. Philip felt himself a great deal older than the others. They were raw schoolboys, but age is a matter of knowledge rather than of years, and Newsom, the active young man who was dissecting with him, was very much at home with his subject. He was perhaps not sorry to show off and he explained very fully to Philip what he was about. Philip, notwithstanding his hidden stores of wisdom, listened meekly. Then Philip took up the scalpel and the tweezers, and began working while the other looked on. "'Ripping to have him so thin,' said Newsom, wiping his hands. "'The blighter can't have had anything to eat for a month.' "'I wonder what he died of,' murmured Philip. "'Oh, I don't know, any old thing. Starvation chiefly, I suppose.' I say, look out, don't cut that artery. It's all very fine to say don't cut that artery, remarked one of the men working on the opposite leg. Silly old fool's got an artery in the wrong place. Arteries are always in the wrong place, said Newsom. The normal's the one thing you practically never get. That's why it's called the normal. Don't say things like that, said Philip, or I shall cut myself. If you cut yourself, answered Newsom, full of information, wash it at once with antiseptic. It's the one thing you've got to be careful about. There was a chap here last year who gave himself only a prick, and he didn't bother about it, and he got septicemia. Did he get all right? Oh, no, he died in a week. I went and had a look at him in the P.M. room. Philip's back ached by the time it was proper to have tea, and his luncheon had been so light that he was quite ready for it. His hand smelt of that peculiar odor which he had first noticed that morning in the corridor. He thought his muffin tasted of it, too. "'Oh, you'll get used to that,' said Newsom. "'When you don't have the good old dissecting-room stink about, you feel quite lonely.' "'I'm not going to let it spoil my appetite,' said Philip, as he followed up the muffin with a piece of cake. End of chapter 54 Chapter 55 Philip's ideas of the life of medical students, like those of the public at large, were founded on the pictures which Charles Dickens drew in the middle of the nineteenth century. He soon discovered that Bob Sawyer, if he ever existed, was no longer at all like the medical student of the present. It is a mixed lot which enters upon the medical profession, and naturally there are some who are lazy and reckless. They think it is an easy life, idle away a couple of years, and then because their funds come to an end, or because angry parents refuse any longer to support them, drift away from the hospital. Others find the examinations too hard for them. One failure after another robs them of their nerve. And panic-stricken, they forget as soon as they come into the forbidding buildings of the conjoint board the knowledge which before they had so packed. They remain year after year, objects of good-humored scorn to the younger men. Some of them crawl through the examination of the apothecary's hall. Others become non-qualified assistants, a precarious position in which they are at the mercy of their employers. Their lot is poverty, drunkenness, and heaven only knows their end. But for the most part medical students are industrious young men of the middle class, with a sufficient allowance to live in the respectable fashion they have been used to. Many are the sons of doctors who have already something of the professional manner. Their career is mapped out. As soon as they are qualified, they propose to apply for a hospital appointment, after holding which, and perhaps a trip to the Far East as a ship's doctor, they will join their father and spend the rest of their days in a country practice. One or two are marked out as exceptionally brilliant. They will take the various prizes and scholarships which are open each year to the deserving, get one appointment after another at the hospital, go on the staff, 
take a consulting room in Harley Street, and, specializing in one subject or another, become prosperous, eminent, and titled. The medical profession is the only one which a man may enter at any age with some chance of making a living. Among the men of Philip's year were three or four who were past their first youth. One had been in the Navy, from which, according to report, he had been dismissed for drunkenness. He was a man of thirty with a red face, a brusque manner, and a loud voice. Another was a married man with two children who had lost money through a defaulting solicitor. He had a bowed look as if the world were too much for him. He went about his work silently, and it was plain that he found it difficult at his age to commit facts to memory. His mind worked slowly. His effort at application was painful to see. Philip made himself at home in his tiny room. He arranged his books and hung on the walls such pictures and sketches as he possessed. Above him on the drawing-room floor lived a fifth-year man called Griffiths. But Philip saw little of him, partly because he was occupied chiefly in the wards, and partly because he had been to Oxford. Some of the students, as had been to a university, kept a good deal together. They used a variety of means natural to the young in order to impress upon the less fortunate a proper sense of their inferiority. The rest of the students found their Olympian serenity rather hard to bear. Griffiths was a tall fellow, with a quantity of curly red hair and blue eyes, a white skin, and a very red mouth. He was one of those fortunate people whom everybody liked, for he had high spirits and a constant gaiety. He strummed a little on the piano and sang comic songs with gusto, and evening after evening, while Philip was reading in his solitary room, he heard the shouts and the uproarious laughter of Griffith's friends above him. He thought of those delightful evenings in Paris when they would sit in the studio, Lawson and he, Flanagan and Clutton, and talk of art and morals, the love affairs of the present, and the fame of the future. He felt sick at heart. He found it was easy to make a heroic gesture, but hard to abide by its results. The worst of it was that the work seemed to him very tedious. He had got out of the habit of being asked questions by demonstrators. His attention wandered at lectures. Anatomy was a dreary science, a mere matter of learning by heart an enormous number of facts. Dissection bored him. He did not see the use of dissecting out laboriously nerves and arteries when with much less trouble you could see in the diagrams of a book or in the specimens of the pathological museum exactly where they were. He made friends by chance, but not intimate friends, for he seemed to have nothing in particular to say to his companions. When he tried to interest himself in their concerns, he felt that they found him patronizing. He was not one of those who can talk of what moves them without caring whether it bores or not the people they talk to. One man, hearing that he had studied art in Paris and fancying himself on his taste, tried to discuss art with him. But Philip was impatient of views which did not agree with his own, and finding quickly that the other's ideas were conventional grew monosyllabic. Philip desired popularity, but could bring himself to make no advances to others. A fear of rebuff prevented him from affability, and he concealed his shyness, which was still intense, under a frigid taciturnity. He was going through the same experience as he had done at school, but here the freedom of the medical student's life made it possible for him to live a good deal by himself. It was through no effort of his that he became friendly with Dunsford, the fresh-complexioned heavy lad whose acquaintances he had made at the beginning of the session. Dunsford attached himself to Philip merely because he was the first person he had known at St. Luke's. He had no friends in London, and on Saturday nights he and Philip got into the habit of going together to the pit of a music hall or the gallery of a theatre. He was stupid, but he was good-natured and never took offence. He always said the obvious thing, but when Philip laughed at him merely smiled. He had a very sweet smile. Though Philip made him his butt, he liked him. He was amused by his candour and delighted with his agreeable nature. Dunsford had the charm which himself was acutely conscious of not possessing. They often went to have tea at a shop in Parliament Street, because Dunsford admired one of the young women who waited. Philip did not find anything attractive in her. She was tall and thin, with narrow hips, and the chest of a boy. "'No one would look at her in Paris,' said Philip scornfully. "'She's got a ripping face,' said Dunsford. 
What does the face matter? She had the small, regular features, the blue eyes, and the broad, low brow which the Victorian painters Lord Leighton, Alma Tadema, and a hundred others induced the world they lived in to accept as a type of Greek beauty. She seemed to have a great deal of hair. It was arranged with peculiar elaboration and done over the forehead in what she called an Alexandra fringe. She was very anemic. Her thin lips were pale and her skin was delicate, of a faint green color, without a touch of red even in the cheeks. She had very good teeth. She took great pains to prevent her work from spoiling her hands, and they were small, thin, and white. She went about her duties with a bored look. Dunsford, very shy with women, had never succeeded in getting into conversation with her, and he urged Philip to help him. "'All I want is a lead,' he said, "'and then I can manage for myself.' Philip, to please him, made one or two remarks, but she answered with monosyllables. She had taken their measure. They were boys, and she surmised they were students. She had no use for them. Dunsford noticed that a man with sandy hair and a bristly moustache who looked like a German was favored with her attention whenever he came into the shop, and then it was only by calling her two or three times that they could induce her to take their order. She used the clients whom she did not know with frigid insolence, and when she was talking to a friend was perfectly indifferent to the calls of the hurry. She had the art of treating women who desired refreshment with just that degree of impertinence which irritated them without affording them an opportunity of complaining to the management. One day Dunsford told him her name was Mildred. He had heard one of the other girls in the shop address her. "'What an odious name,' said Philip. "'Why?' asked Dunsford. I like it. It's so pretentious. It chanced that on this day the German was not there, and when she brought the tea, Philip, smiling, remarked, Your friend's not here today. I don't know what you mean, she said coldly. I was referring to the nobleman with the sandy moustache. Has he left you for another? Some people would do better to mind their own business, she retorted. She left them, and since for a moment or two there was no one to attend to, sat down and looked at the evening paper which a customer had left behind. "'You are a fool to put her back up,' said Dunsford. "'I'm really quite indifferent to the attitude of her vertebrae,' replied Philip. But he was piqued. It irritated him that when he tried to be agreeable with a woman she should take offence. When he asked for the bill he hazarded a remark which he meant to lead further. "'Are we no longer on speaking terms?' he smiled. "'I'm here to take orders and to wait on customers.' I've got nothing to say to them, and I don't want them to say anything to me. She put down the slip of paper on which she had marked the sum they had to pay, and walked back to the table at which she had been sitting. Philip flushed with anger. That's one in the eye for you, Carrie, said Dunsford when they get outside. Ill-mannered slut, said Philip. I shan't go there again. His influence with Dunsford was strong enough to get him to take their tea elsewhere, and Dunsford soon found another young woman to flirt with but the snub which the waitress had inflicted on him rankled. If she had treated him with civility he would have been perfectly indifferent to her. But it was obvious that she disliked him rather than otherwise, and his pride was wounded. He could not suppress a desire to be even with her. He was impatient with himself because he had so petty a feeling, but three or days' firmness during which he would not go to the shop did not help him to surmount it and he came to the conclusion that it would be least trouble to see her. Having done so he would certainly cease to think of her. Pretexting an appointment one afternoon, for he was not a little ashamed of his weakness, he left Dunsford and went straight to the shop which he had vowed never again to enter. He saw the waitress the moment he came in and sat down at one of her tables. He expected her to make some reference to the fact that he had not been there for a week, but when she came up for his order she said nothing. He had heard her say to other customers, "'You're quite a stranger.' She gave no sign that she had ever seen him before. In order to see whether she had really forgotten him, when she brought his tea he asked, "'Have you seen my friend tonight?' "'No, he's not been in here for some days.' He wanted to use this as the beginning of a conversation, but he was strangely nervous and could think of nothing to say. She gave him no opportunity, but at once went away." He had no chance of saying anything till he asked for his bill. "'Filthy weather, isn't it?' he said. It was mortifying that he had been forced to prepare such a phrase as that. 
he could not make out why she filled him with such embarrassment. It doesn't make much difference to me what the weather is, having to be in here all day. There was an insolence in her tone that peculiarly irritated him. A sarcasm rose to his lips, but he forced himself to be silent. I wish to God she'd say something really cheeky, he raged to himself, so that I could report her and get her sacked. It would serve her damned well right. End of chapter 55 Chapter 56 He could not get her out of his mind. He laughed angrily at his own foolishness. It was absurd to care what an anemic little waitress said to him, but he was strangely humiliated. Though no one knew of the humiliation but Dunsford, and he had certainly forgotten, Philip felt that he could have no peace till he had wiped it out. He thought over what he had better do. He made up his mind that he would go to the shop every day. It was obvious that he had made a disagreeable impression on her, but he thought he had the wits to eradicate it. He would take care not to say anything at which the most susceptible person could be offended. All this he did, but it had no effect. When he went in and said good evening she answered with the same words, but when once he omitted to say it in order to see whether she would say it first, she said nothing at all. He murmured in his heart an expression which, though frequently applicable to members of the female sex, is not often used of them in polite society. But with an unmoved face he ordered his tea. He made up his mind not to speak a word, and left the shop without his usual good night. He promised himself that he would not go any more, but the next day at tea-time he grew restless. He tried to think of other things, but he had no command over his thoughts. At last he said desperately, After all, there's no reason why I shouldn't go if I want to. The struggle with himself had taken a long time, and it was getting on for seven when he entered the shop. I thought you weren't coming, the girl said to him when he sat down. His heart leaped in his bosom, and he felt himself reddening. I was detained. I couldn't come before. Cutting up people, I suppose. Not so bad as that. You are a student, aren't you? Yes. But that seemed to satisfy her curiosity. She went away, and, since at that late hour there was nobody else at her tables, she immersed herself in a novelette. This was before the time of the sixpenny reprints. There was a regular supply of inexpensive fiction written to order by poor hacks for the consumption of the illiterate. Philip was elated. She had addressed him of her own accord. He saw the time approaching when his turn would come, and he would tell her exactly what he thought of her. It would be a great comfort to express the immensity of his contempt. He looked at her. It was true that her profile was beautiful. It was extraordinary how English girls of that class had so often a perfection of outline which took your breath away. But it was as cold as marble, and the faint green of her delicate skin gave an impression of unhealthiness. All the waitresses were dressed alike in plain black dresses with a white apron, cuffs, and a small cap. On a half-sheet of paper that he had in his pocket, Philip made a sketch of her as he sat leaning over her book. She outlined the words with her lips as she read, and left it on the table when he went away. It was an inspiration, for next day, when he came in, she smiled at him. "'I didn't know you could draw,' she said. "'I was an art student in Paris for two years. I showed that drawing you'd left behind last night to the manageress, and she was struck with it. Was it meant to be me?' It was, said Philip. When she went for his tea, one of the other girls came up to him. I saw that picture you done of Miss Rogers. It was the very image of her, she said. That was the first time he had heard her name, and when he wanted his bill he called her by it. I see you know my name, she said, when she came. Your friend mentioned it when she said something to me about that drawing. She wants you to do one of her. Don't you do it. If you once begin you'll have to go on and they'll all be wanting you to do them. Then, without a pause, with peculiar inconsequence, she said, Where's that young fellow that used to come with you? Has he gone away? Fancying you remembering him, said Philip. He was a nice-looking young fellow. Philip felt quite a peculiar sensation in his heart. He did not know what it was. Dunsford had jolly curling hair, a fresh complexion, and a beautiful smile. Philip thought of these advantages with envy. Oh, he's in love, said he with a little laugh. Philip repeated every word of the conversation to himself as he limped home. 
She was quite friendly with him now. When opportunity arose he would offer to make a more finished sketch of her, he was sure she would like that. Her face was interesting, the profile was lovely, and there was something curiously fascinating about the chloratic color. He tried to think what it was like. At first he thought of pea soup, but driving away that idea angrily he thought of the petals of a yellow rosebud when you tore it to pieces before it had burst. He had no ill feeling towards her now. "'She's not a bad sort,' he murmured. It was silly of him to take offence at what she had said. It was doubtless his own fault. She had not meant to make herself disagreeable. He ought to be accustomed by now to making at first sight a bad impression on people. He was flattered at the success of his drawing. She looked upon him with more interest now that she was aware of this small talent. He was restless next day. He thought of going to lunch at the tea-shop, but he was certain there would be many people there then, and Mildred would not be able to talk to him. He had managed before this to get out of having tea with Dunsford, and, punctually at half-past four, he had looked at his watch a dozen times, he went into the shop. Mildred had her back turned to him. She was sitting down talking to the German whom Philip had seen there every day till a fortnight ago, and since then had not seen at all. She was laughing at what he said. Philip thought she had a common laugh, and it made him shudder. He called her, but she took no notice. He called her again, then, growing angry for he was impatient, he rapped the table loudly with a stick. She approached sulkily. "'How do you do?' he said. "'You seem to be in a great hurry.' She looked down at him with the insolent manner which he knew so well. "'I say, what's the matter with you? If you'll kindly give me your order I'll get what you want. I can't stand talking all night. Tea and toasted bun, please, Philip answered briefly. He was furious with her. He had the star with him and read it elaborately when she brought the tea. If you'll give me my bill now, I needn't trouble you again, he said icily. She wrote out the slip, placed it on the table, and went back to the German. Soon she was talking to him with animation. He was a man of middle height with the round head of his nation and a sallow face. His moustache was large and bristling, he had on a tailcoat and grey trousers, and he wore a massive gold watch-chain. Philip thought the other girls looked from him to the pair at the table and exchanged significant glances. He felt certain they were laughing at him and his blood boiled. He detested Mildred now with all his heart. He knew that the best thing he could do was to cease coming to the tea-shop, but he could not bear to think that he had been worsted in the affair and he devised a plan to show her that he despised her. Next day he sat down at another table and ordered his tea from another waitress. Mildred's friend was there again, and she was talking to him. She paid no attention to Philip, and so when he went out he chose a moment when she had to cross his path. As he passed he looked at her as though he had never seen her before. He repeated this for three or four days. He expected that Presently she would take the opportunity to say something to him. He thought she would ask why he never came to one of her tables now, and he had prepared an answer charged with all the loathing he felt for her. He knew it was absurd to trouble, but he could not help himself. She had beaten him again. The German suddenly disappeared, but Philip still sat at other tables. She paid no attention to him. Suddenly he realized that what he did was a matter of complete indifference to her. He could go on in that way till doomsday, and it would have no effect. "'I'm not finished yet,' he said to himself. The day after he sat down in his old seat, and when she came up said good evening as though he had not ignored her for a week. His face was placid, but he could not prevent the mad beating of his heart. At that time the musical comedy had lately leaped into public favor and he was sure that Mildred would be delighted to go to one. "'I say,' he said suddenly, "'I wonder if you'd dine with me one night and come to the Bell of New York. I'll get a couple of stalls.' He added the last sentence in order to tempt her. He knew that when the girls went to the play it was either in the pit, or, if some man took them, seldom to more expensive seats than the upper circle. Mildred's pale face showed no change of expression. "'I don't mind,' she said. When will you come? I get off early on Thursdays. They made arrangements. Mildred lived with an aunt at Hearn Hill. The play began at eight, so they must dine at seven. 
she proposed that he should meet her in the second-class waiting-room at Victoria Station. She showed no pleasure, but accepted the invitation as though she conferred a favor. Philip was vaguely irritated. End of chapter 56 Recording by Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maud Chapter 57 Philip arrived at Victoria Station nearly half an hour before the time which Mildred had appointed, and sat down in the second-class waiting-room. He waited, and she did not come. He began to grow anxious and walked into the station, watching the incoming suburban trains. The hour which she had fixed passed, and still there was no sign of her. Philip was impatient. He went into the other waiting-rooms and looked at the people sitting in them. Suddenly his heart gave a great thud. "'There you are. I thought you were never coming. I liked that after keeping me waiting all this time. I had half a mind to go back home again. But you said you'd come to the second-class waiting-room. I didn't say any such thing. It isn't exactly like I'd sit in the second-class room when I could sit in the first, is it?' Though Philip was sure he had not made a mistake, he said nothing, and they got into a cab. "'Where are we dining?' she asked. I thought of the Adelphi restaurant. Will that suit you? I don't mind where we dine. She spoke ungraciously. She was put out by being kept waiting and answered Philip's attempted at conversation with monosyllables. She wore a long cloak of some rough dark material and a crochet shawl over her head. They reached the restaurant and sat down at a table. She looked round with satisfaction. The red shades to the candles on the tables, the gold of the decorations, the looking-glasses lent the room a sumptuous air. "'I've never been here before.' She gave Philip a smile. She had taken off her cloak, and he saw that she wore a pale blue dress cut square at the neck, and her hair was more elaborately arranged than ever. He had ordered champagne, and when it came her eyes sparkled. "'You are going with it,' she said. "'Because I've ordered fizz?' he asked carelessly, as though he never drank anything else. I was surprised when you asked me to do a theatre with you. Conversation did not go very easily, for she did not seem to have much to say, and Philip was nervously conscious that he was not amusing her. She listened carelessly to his remarks, with her eyes on other diners, and made no pretense that she was interested in him. He made one or two little jokes, but she took them quite seriously. The only sign of vivacity he got was when he spoke of the other girls in the shop. She could not bear the manageress, and told him all her misdeeds at length. I can't stick her at any price, and all the air she gives herself. Sometimes I've got more than half a mind to tell her something she doesn't think I know anything about. What is that? asked Philip. Well, I happen to know that she's not above going to Eastbourne with a man for the weekend now and again. One of the girls has a married sister who goes there with her husband, and she's seen her. She was staying at the same boarding-house, and she had a wedding ring on, and I know, for one, she's not married. Philip filled her glass, hoping that champagne would make her more affable. He was anxious that his little jaunt should be a success. He noticed that she held her knife as though it were a penholder, and when she drank protruded her little finger. He started several topics of conversation, but he could get little out of her, and he remembered with irritation that he had seen her talking nineteen to the dozen and laughing with the German. They finished dinner and went to the play. Philip was a very cultured young man, and he looked upon musical comedy with scorn. He thought the jokes vulgar and the melodies obvious. It seemed to him that they did these things much better in France. But Mildred enjoyed herself thoroughly. She laughed till her sides ached, looking at Philip now and then when something tickled her to exchange a glance of pleasure, and she applauded rapturously. "'This is the seventh time I've been,' she said after the first act, "'and I don't mind if I come seven times more.' She was much interested in the women who surrounded them in the stalls. She pointed out to Philip those who were painted and those who wore false hair. "'It is horrible, these West End people,' she said. I don't know how they can do it. She put her hand to her hair. Mine's all my own, every bit of it. She found no one to admire, and whenever she spoke of anyone it was to say something disagreeable. It made Philip uneasy. 
He supposed that next day she would tell the girls in the shop that he had taken her out and that he had bored her to death. He disliked her, and yet, he knew not why, he wanted to be with her. On the way home he asked, "'I hope you've enjoyed yourself?' "'Rather.' "'Will you come out with me again one evening?' "'I don't mind.' He could never get beyond such expressions as that. Her indifference maddened him. "'That sounds as if you didn't much care if you came or not. Oh, if you don't take me out, some other fellow will. I need never want for men who'll take me to the theatre. Philip was silent. They came to the station, and he went to the booking office. "'I've got my season,' she said. "'I thought I'd take you home as it's rather late, if you don't mind. Oh, I don't mind if it gives you any pleasure.' He took a single first for her and a return for himself. "'Well, you're not mean, I will say that for you,' she said when he opened the carriage door. Philip did not know whether he was pleased or sorry when other people entered, and it was impossible to speak. They got out at Hearn Hill, and he accompanied her to the corner of the road in which she lived. "'I'll say good-night to you here,' she said, holding out her hand. "'You'd better not come up to the door. I know what people are, and I don't want to have anybody talking.' She said good-night and walked quickly away. He could see the white shawl in the darkness. He thought she might turn round, but she did not. Philip saw which house she went into, and in a moment he walked along to look at it. It was a trim, common little house of yellow brick, exactly like all the other little houses in the street. He stood outside for a few minutes, and presently the window on the top floor was darkened. Philip strolled slowly back to the station. The evening had been unsatisfactory. He felt irritated, restless, and miserable. When he lay in bed he seemed still to see her sitting in the corner of the railway carriage with the white crochet shawl over her head. He did not know how he was to get through the hours that must pass before his eyes rested on her again. He thought drowsily of her thin face with its delicate features and the greenish pallor of her skin. He was not happy with her, but he was unhappy away from her. He wanted to sit by her side and look at her. He wanted to touch her. He wanted... The thought came to him, and he did not finish. Suddenly he grew wide awake. He wanted to kiss the thin, pale mouth with its narrow lips. The truth came to him at last. He was in love with her. It was incredible. He had often thought of falling in love, and there was one scene which he had pictured to himself over and over again. He saw himself coming into a ballroom. His eyes fell on a little group of men and women talking, and one of the women turned round. Her eyes fell upon him, and he knew that the gasp in his throat was in her throat, too. He stood quite still. She was tall and dark and beautiful with eyes like the night. She was dressed in white and in her black hair shone diamonds. They stared at one another, forgetting that people surrounded them. He went straight up to her, and she moved a little towards him. Both felt that the formality of introduction was out of place. He spoke to her. "'I've been looking for you all my life,' he said. "'You've come at last,' she murmured. "'Will you dance with me?' She surrendered herself to his outstretched hands, and they danced. Philip always pretended that he was not lame. She danced divinely. "'I've never danced with anyone who danced like you,' she said. He tore up her program, and they danced together the whole evening. "'I'm so thankful that I waited for you,' he said to her. "'I knew that in the end I must meet you.' People in the ballroom stared. They did not care. They did not wish to hide their passion. At last they went into the garden. He flung a light cloak over her shoulders and put her in a waiting cab. They caught the midnight train to Paris, and they sped through the silent, starlit night into the unknown. He thought of this old fancy of his, and it seemed impossible that he should be in love with Mildred Rogers. Her name was grotesque. He did not think her pretty. He hated the thinness of her. Only that evening he had noticed how the bones of her chest stood out in evening dress. He went over her features one by one. He did not like her mouth, and the unhealthiness of her color vaguely repelled him. She was common. Her phrases, so bald and few, constantly repeated, showed the emptiness of her mind. 
he recalled her vulgar little laugh at the jokes of the musical comedy, and he remembered the little finger carefully extended when she held her glass to her mouth. Her manners, like her conversation, were obviously genteel. He remembered her insolence. Sometimes he had felt inclined to box her ears, and suddenly, he knew not why, perhaps it was the thought of hitting her or the recollection of her tiny beautiful ears, he was seized by an uprush of emotion. He yearned for her. He thought of taking her in his arms, the thin, fragile body, and kissing her pale mouth. He wanted to pass his fingers down the slightly greenish cheeks. He wanted her. He had thought of love as a rapture which seized one so that all the world seemed spring-like. He had looked forward to an ecstatic happiness. But this was not happiness. It was a hunger of the soul. It was a painful yearning. It was a bitter anguish he had never known before. He tried to think when it had first come to him. He did not know. He only remembered that each time he had gone into the shop, after the first two or three times, it had been with a little feeling in the heart that was pain, and he remembered that when she spoke to him he felt curiously breathless. When she left him it was wretchedness, and when she came to him again it was despair. He stretched himself in his bed as a dog stretches himself. He wondered how he was going to endure that ceaseless aching of his soul. Chapter 58 Philip woke early next morning, and his first thought was of Mildred. It struck him that he might meet her at Victoria Station and walk with her to the shop. He shaved quickly, scrambled into his clothes, and took a bus to the station. He was there by twenty to eight and watched the incoming trains. Crowds poured out of them, clerks and shop people at that early hour, and thronged up the platform. They hurried along, sometimes in pairs, here and there a group of girls, but more often alone. They were white, most of them, ugly in the early morning, and they had an abstracted look. The younger ones walked lightly as though the cement of the platform were pleasant to tread, but the others went as though impelled by a machine. Their faces were set in an anxious frown. At last Philip saw Mildred, and he went up to her eagerly. "'Good morning,' he said. "'I thought I'd come and see how you were after last night.' She wore an old brown ulcer and a sailor hat. It was very clear that she was not pleased to see him. "'Oh, I'm all right. I haven't got much time to waste. Do you mind if I walk down Victoria Street with you?' "'I'm none too early. I shall have to walk fast,' she answered, looking down at Philip's club foot. He turned scarlet. "'I beg your pardon. I won't detain you. You can please yourself.' She went on, and he, with a sinking heart, made his way home to breakfast. He hated her. He knew he was a fool to bother about her. She was not the sort of woman who would ever care two straws for him, and she must look upon his deformity with distaste. He made up his mind that he would not go in to tea that afternoon, but, hating himself, he went. She nodded to him as he came in and smiled. "'I expect I was rather short with you this morning,' she said. "'You see, I didn't expect you, and it came like a surprise.' "'Oh, it doesn't matter at all.' He felt that a great weight had suddenly been lifted from him. He was infinitely grateful for one word of kindness. "'Why don't you sit down?' he asked. "'Nobody's wanting you just now. I don't mind if I do.' He looked at her, but could think of nothing to say. He racked his brains anxiously, seeking for a remark which should keep her by him. He wanted to tell her how much she meant to him. But he did not know how to make love now that he loved in earnest. "'Where's your friend with the fair moustache? I haven't seen him lately.' "'Oh, he's gone back to Birmingham. He's in business there.' He only comes up to London every now and again. "'Is he in love with you?' "'You'd better ask him,' she said with a laugh. "'I don't know what it's got to do with you if he is.' A bitter answer leaped to his tongue, but he was learning self-restraint. "'I wonder why you say things like that,' was all he permitted himself to say. She looked at him with those indifferent eyes of hers. "'It looks as if you didn't set much store on me,' he added. "'Why should I?' "'No reason at all.' He reached over for his paper. "'You are quick-tempered,' she said when she saw the gesture. "'You do take offense easily.' He smiled and looked at her appealingly. "'Will you do something for me?' he asked. 
That depends what it is. Let me walk back to the station with you tonight. I don't mind. He went out after tea and went back to his rooms, but at eight o'clock, when the shop closed, he was waiting outside. You are a caution, she said when she came out. I don't understand you. I shouldn't have thought it was very difficult, he answered bitterly. Did any of the girls see you waiting for me? I don't know, and I don't care. They all laugh at you, you know. They say you're spoony on me. Much you care, he muttered. Now then, quarrelsome. At the station he took a ticket and said he was going to accompany her home. You don't seem to have much to do with your time, she said. I suppose I can waste it in my own way. They seemed to be always on the verge of a quarrel. The fact was that he hated himself for loving her. She seemed to be constantly humiliating him, and for each snub that he endured he owed her a grudge. But she was in a friendly mood that evening, and talkative. She told them that her parents were dead. She gave him to understand that she did not have to earn her living, but worked for amusement. "'My aunt doesn't like my going to business. I can have the best of everything at home. I don't want you to think I work because I need to.' Philip knew that she was not speaking the truth. The gentility of her class made her use this pretense to avoid the stigma attached to earning her living. "'My family's very well connected,' she said. Philip smiled faintly, and she noticed it. "'What are you laughing at?' she said quickly. "'Don't you believe I'm telling you the truth?' "'Of course I do,' he answered. She looked at him suspiciously, but in a moment could not resist the temptation to impress him with the splendor of her early days. "'My father always kept a dog-cart, and we had three servants. We had a cook and a housemaid and an odd man. We used to grow beautiful roses. People used to stop at the gate and ask who the house belonged to. The roses were so beautiful. Of course it wasn't very nice for me having to mix with them girls in the shop. It's not the class of person I've been used to. And sometimes I really think I'll give up business on that account. It's not the work I mind. Don't mind that. But it's the class of people I have to mix with. They were sitting opposite one another in the train, and Philip, listening sympathetically to what she said, was quite happy. He was amused at her naivete and slightly touched. There was a very faint color in her cheeks. He was thinking that it would be delightful to kiss the tip of her chin. The moment you came into the shop I saw you was a gentleman in every sense of the word. Was your father a professional man? He was a doctor. You can always tell a professional man. There's something about them. I don't know what it is, but I know it once. They walked along from the station together. I say, I want you to come and see another play with me, he said. I don't mind, she said. You might go so far as to say you'd like to. Why? It doesn't matter. Let's fix a day. Would Saturday night suit you? Yes, that'll do. They made further arrangements and then found themselves at the corner of the road in which she lived. She gave him her hand, and he held it. I say, I do so awfully want to call you Mildred. You may if you like. I don't care. And you'll call me Philip, won't you? I will if I can think of it. It seems more natural to call you Mr. Carey. He drew her slightly towards him, but she leaned back. What are you doing? Won't you kiss me good night? he whispered. Impotence, she said. She snatched her hand away and hurried towards the house. Philip bought tickets for Saturday night. It was not one of the days on which she got off early, and therefore she would have no time to go home and change, but she meant to bring a frock up with her in the morning and hurry into her clothes at the shop. If the manageress was in a good temper she would let her go at seven. Philip had agreed to wait outside from a quarter past seven onwards. He looked forward to the occasion with painful eagerness, for in the cab on the way from the theatre to the station he thought she would let him kiss her. The vehicle gave every facility for a man to put his arm round a girl's waist, an advantage which the hansom had over the taxi of the present day, and the delight of that was worth the cost of the evening's entertainment. But on Saturday afternoon when he went in to have tea in order to confirm the arrangements he met the man with the fair moustache coming out of the shop. He knew by now that he was called Miller. He was a naturalized German who had anglicized his name 
and he had lived many years in England. Philip had heard him speak, and though his English was fluent and natural, it had not quite the intonation of the native. Philip knew that he was flirting with Mildred, and he was horribly jealous of him. But he took comfort in the coldness of her temperament which otherwise distressed him. And, thinking her incapable of passion, he looked upon his rival as no better off than himself. But his heart sank now, for his first thought was that Miller's sudden appearance might interfere with the jaunt which he had so looked forward to. He entered sick with apprehension. The waitress came up to him, took his order for tea, and presently brought it. "'I'm awfully sorry,' she said with an expression on her face of real distress. "'I shan't be able to come to-night, after all.' "'Why?' said Philip. "'Don't look so stern about it,' she laughed. "'It's not my fault. My aunt was taken ill last night, and it's the girl's night out, so I must go and sit with her. She can't be left alone, can she?' "'It doesn't matter. I'll see you home instead. But you've got the tickets. It would be a pity to waste them.' He took them out of his pocket and deliberately tore them up. "'What are you doing that for?' "'You don't suppose I want to go and see a rotten musical comedy by myself, do you? I only took seats there for your sake. You can't see me home if that's what you mean. You've made other arrangements.' "'I don't know what you mean by that. You're just as selfish as all the rest of them. You only think of yourself. It's not my fault if my aunt's queer.' She quickly wrote out his bill and left him. Philip knew very little about women, or he would have been aware that one should accept their most transparent lies. He made up his mind that he would watch the shop and see for certain whether Mildred went out with the German. He had an unhappy passion for certainty. At seven he stationed himself on the opposite pavement. He looked about for Miller, but did not see him. In ten minutes she came out. She had on the cloak and shawl which she had worn when he took her to the Shaftesbury Theatre. It was obvious that she was not going home. She saw him before he had time to move away, started a little, and then came straight up to him. "'What are you doing here?' she said. "'Taking the air,' he answered. "'You're spying on me, you dirty little cad. I thought you was a gentleman. Did you think a gentleman would be likely to take any interest in you?' he murmured. There was a devil within him which forced him to make matters worse. He wanted to hurt her as much as she was hurting him. I suppose I can change my mind if I like. I'm not obliged to come out with you. I tell you I'm going home and I won't be followed or spied upon. Have you seen Miller today? That's no business of yours. In point of fact I haven't, so you're wrong again. I saw him this afternoon. He'd just come out of the shop when I went in. Well, what if he did? I can go out with him if I want to, can't I? I don't know what you've got to say to it. He's keeping you waiting, isn't he? well i'd rather wait for him than have you wait for me put that in your pipe and smoke it and now perhaps you'll go off home and mind your own business in future his mood changed suddenly from anger to despair and his voice trembled when he spoke i say don't be beastly with me mildred you know i'm awfully fond of you i think i love you with all my heart won't you change your mind i was looking forward to this evening so awfully you see, he hasn't come, and he can't care twopence about you, really. Won't you dine with me? I'll get some more tickets, and we'll go anywhere you like. I tell you I won't. It's no good you talking. I've made up my mind, and when I make up my mind, I keep to it. He looked at her for a moment. His heart was torn with anguish. People were hurrying past them on the pavement, and cabs and omnibuses rolled by noisily. He saw that Mildred's eyes were wondering. She was afraid of missing Miller in the crowd. "'I can't go on like this,' groaned Philip. "'It's too degrading. If I go now, I go for good. Unless you'll come with me tonight, you'll never see me again. You seem to think that'll be an awful thing for me. All I can say is, good riddance to bad rubbish. Then good-bye.' He nodded and limped away slowly, for he had hoped with all his heart that she would call him back. At the next lamp-post he stopped and looked over his shoulder. He thought she might beckon to him. He was willing to forget everything. He was ready for any humiliation. But she had turned away and apparently had ceased to trouble about him. He realized that she was glad to be quit of him. End of chapter 58 
Chapter 59 Philip passed the evening wretchedly. He had told his landlady that he would not be in, so there was nothing for him to eat, and he had to go to Gotti's for dinner. Afterwards he went back to his rooms, but Griffiths on the floor above him was having a party, and the noisy merriment made his own misery more hard to bear. He went to a music hall, but it was Saturday night and there was standing room only. After half an hour of boredom his legs grew tired and he went home. He tried to read but he could not fix his attention, and yet it was necessary that he should work hard. His examination in biology was in little more than a fortnight, and though it was easy he had neglected his lectures of late and was conscious that he knew nothing. It was only a viva, however, and he felt sure that in a fortnight he could find out enough about the subject to scrape through. He had confidence in his intelligence. He threw aside his book and gave himself up to thinking deliberately of the matter which was in his mind all the time. He reproached himself bitterly for his behavior that evening. Why had he given her the alternative that she must dine with him, or else never see him again? Of course she refused. He should have allowed for her pride. He had burnt his ships behind him. It would not be so hard to bear if he thought that she was suffering now. But he knew her too well. She was perfectly indifferent to him. If he hadn't been a fool he would have pretended to believe her story. He ought to have had the strength to conceal his disappointment and the self-control to master his temper. He could not tell why he loved her. He had read of the idealization that takes place in love, but he saw her exactly as she was. She was not amusing or clever, her mind was common. She had a vulgar shrewdness which revolted him. She had no gentleness nor softness. As she would have put it herself, she was on the make. What aroused her admiration was a clever trick played on an unsuspecting person. To do somebody always gave her satisfaction. Philip laughed savagely as he thought of her gentility and the refinement with which she ate her food. She could not bear a coarse word. So far as her limited vocabulary reached she had a passion for euphemisms, and she scented indecency everywhere. She never spoke of trousers, but referred to them as nether garments. She thought it slightly indelicate to blow her nose and did so in a deprecating way. She was dreadfully anemic and suffered from the dyspepsia which accompanies that ailing. Philip was repelled by her flat breast and narrow hips, and he hated the vulgar way in which she did her hair. He loathed and despised himself for loving her. The fact remained that he was helpless. He felt just as he had felt sometimes in the hands of a bigger boy at school. He had struggled against the superior strength till his own strength was gone and he was rendered quite powerless. He remembered the peculiar languor he had felt in his limbs almost as though he were paralyzed, so that he could not help himself at all. He might have been dead. He felt just that same weakness now. He loved the woman so that he knew he had never loved before. He did not mind her faults of person or of character. He thought he loved them too. At all events they meant nothing to him. It did not seem himself that was concerned. He felt that he had been seized by some strange force that moved him against his will, contrary to his interests, and because he had a passion for freedom he hated the chains which bound him. He laughed at himself when he thought how often he had longed to experience the overwhelming passion. He cursed himself because he had given way to it. He thought of the beginnings. Nothing of all this would have happened if he had not gone into the shop with Dunsford. The whole thing was his own fault. Except for his ridiculous vanity he would never have troubled himself with the ill-mannered slut. At all events the occurrences of that evening had finished the whole affair. Unless he was lost to all sense of shame he could not go back. He wanted passionately to get rid of the love that obsessed him. It was degrading and hateful. He must prevent himself from thinking of her. In a little while the anguish he suffered must grow less. His mind went back to the past. He wondered whether Emily Wilkinson and Fanny Price had endured on his account anything like the torment that he suffered now. He felt a pang of remorse. I didn't know then 
what it was like, he said to himself. He slept very badly. The next day was Sunday and he worked at his biology. He sat with the book in front of him, forming the words with his lips in order to fix his attention, but he could remember nothing. He found his thoughts going back to Mildred every minute, and he repeated to himself the exact words of the quarrel they had had. He had to force himself back to his book. He went out for a walk. The streets on the south side of the river were dingy enough on weekdays, but there was an energy a coming and going which gave them a sordid vivacity. But on Sundays, with no shops open, no carts in the roadway, silent and depressed, they were indescribably dreary. Philip thought that day would never end. But he was so tired that he slept heavily, and when Monday came he entered life with determination. Christmas was approaching, and a good many of the students had gone into the country for the short holiday between the two parts of the winter session. But Philip had refused his uncle's invitation to go down the black stable. He had given the approaching examination as his excuse, but in point of fact he had been unwilling to leave London and Mildred. He had neglected his work so much that now he had only a fortnight to learn what the curriculum allowed three months for. He set to work seriously. He found it easier each day not to think of Mildred. He congratulated himself on his force of character. The pain he suffered was no longer anguish, but a sort of soreness, like what one might be expected to feel if one had been thrown off a horse and though no bones were broken, were bruised all over and shaken. Philip found that he was able to observe with curiosity the condition he had been in during the last few weeks. He analyzed his feelings with interest. He was a little amused at himself. One thing that struck him was how little under those circumstances it mattered what one thought. The system of personal philosophy, which had given him great satisfaction to devise, had not served him. He was puzzled by this. But sometimes in the street he would see a girl who looked so like Mildred that his heart seemed to stop beating. Then he could not help himself. He hurried on to catch up to her, eager and anxious, only to find that it was a total stranger. Men came back from the country, and he went with Dunsford to have tea at an ABC shop. The well-known uniform made him so miserable that he could not speak. The thought came to him that perhaps she had been transferred to another establishment of the firm for which she worked, and he might suddenly find himself face to face with her. The idea filled him with panic, so that he feared Dunsford would see that something was the matter with him. He could not think of anything to say. He pretended to listen to what Dunsford was talking about. The conversation maddened him and it was all he could do to prevent himself from crying out to Dunsford for heaven's sake to hold his tongue. Then came the day of his examination. Philip, when his turn arrived, went forward to the examiner's table with the utmost confidence. He answered three or four questions. Then they showed him various specimens. He had been to very few lectures, and as soon as he was asked about things which he could not learn from books, he was floored. He did what he could to hide his ignorance, the examiner did not insist, and soon his ten minutes were over. He felt certain he had passed, but next day, when he went up to the examination buildings to see the result posted on the door, he was astounded not to find his number among those who had satisfied the examiners. In amazement he read the list three times. Dunsford was with him. "'I say, I'm awfully sorry you're plowed,' he said. He had just inquired Philip's number. Philip turned and saw by his radiant face that Dunsford had passed. "'Oh, it doesn't matter a bit,' said Philip. "'I'm jolly glad you're all right. I shall go up again in July.' He was very anxious to pretend that he did not mind, and on their way back along the embankment insisted on talking of indifferent things. Dunsford good-naturedly wanted to discuss the causes of Philip's failure, but Philip was obstinately casual. He was horribly mortified, and the fact that Dunsford, whom he looked upon as a very pleasant but quite stupid fellow, had passed made his own rebuff harder to bear. He had always been proud of his intelligence, and now he asked himself desperately whether he was not mistaken in the opinion he held of himself. In the three months of the winter session the students who had joined in October had already shaken down into groups, 
and it was clear which were brilliant, which were clever or industrious, and which were rotters. Philip was conscious that his failure was a surprise to no one but himself. It was tea-time, and he knew that a lot of men would be having tea in the basement of the medical school. Those who had passed the examination would be exultant. Those who disliked him would look at him with satisfaction, and the poor devils who had failed would sympathize with him in order to receive sympathy. His instinct was not to go near the hospital for a week, when the affair would be no more thought of, but because he hated so much to go just then, he went. He wanted to inflict suffering upon himself. He forgot for the moment his maxim of life to follow his inclination with due regard for the policeman round the corner. Or, if he acted in accordance with it, there must have been some strange morbidity in his nature which made him take a grim pleasure in self-torture. But later on, when he had endured the ordeal to which he forced himself, going out into the night after the noisy conversation in the smoking-room, he was seized with a feeling of utter loneliness. He seemed to himself absurd and futile. He had an urgent need of consolation, and the temptation to see Mildred was irresistible. He thought bitterly that there was small chance of consolation from her. But he wanted to see her even if he did not speak to her. After all, she was a waitress and would be obliged to serve him. She was the only person in the world he cared for. There was no use in hiding that fact from himself. Of course it would be humiliating to go back to the shop as though nothing had happened, but he had not much self-respect left. Though he would not confess it to himself, he had hoped each day that she would write to him. She knew that a letter addressed to the hospital would find him, but she had not written. It was evident that she cared nothing if she saw him again or not and he kept on repeating to himself, "'I must see her! I must see her!' The desire was so great that he could not give the time necessary to walk, but jumped in a cab. He was too thrifty to use one when it could possibly be avoided. He stood outside the shop for a minute or two. The thought came to him that perhaps she had left, and in terror he walked in quickly. He saw her at once. He sat down, and she came up to him. A cup of tea and a muffin, please, he ordered. He could hardly speak. He was afraid for a moment that he was going to cry. I almost thought you was dead, she said. She was smiling, smiling. She seemed to have forgotten completely that last scene which Philip had repeated to himself a hundred times. I thought if you'd wanted to see me you'd write, he answered. I've got too much to do to think about writing letters. It seemed impossible for her to say a gracious thing. Philip cursed the fate which chained him to such a woman. She went away to fetch his tea. "'Would you like me to sit down for a minute or two? she said when she brought it. "'Yes. Where have you been all this time?' "'I've been in London. I thought you'd gone away for the holidays. Why haven't you been in then?' Philip looked at her with haggard, passionate eyes. "'Don't you remember that I said I'd never see you again? What are you doing now, then?' She seemed anxious to make him drink up the cup of his humiliation, but he knew her well enough to know that she spoke at random. She hurt him frightfully and never even tried to. He did not answer. "'It was a nasty trick you played on me, spying on me like that. I always thought you was a gentleman in every sense of the word. Don't be beastly to me, Mildred. I can't bear it.' "'You are a funny feller. I can't make you out. It's very simple.' I'm such a blasted fool as to love you with all my heart and soul, and I know that you don't care twopence for me. If you had been a gentleman I think you'd have come next day and begged my pardon. She had no mercy. He looked at her neck and thought how he would like to jab it with the knife he had for his muffin. He knew enough anatomy to make pretty certain of getting the carotid artery. And at the same time he wanted to cover her pale, thin face with kisses. If I could only make you understand how frightfully I'm in love with you. You haven't begged my pardon yet. He grew very white. She felt that she had done nothing wrong on that occasion. She wanted him now to humble himself. He was very proud. For one instant he felt inclined to tell her to go to hell. But he dared not. 
His passion made him abject. He was willing to submit to anything rather than not see her. "'I'm very sorry, Mildred. I beg your pardon.' He had to force the words out. It was a horrible effort. "'Now you said that I don't mind telling you that I wish I had come out with you that evening. I thought Miller was a gentleman, but I've discovered my mistake now. I soon sent him about his business.' Philip gave a little gasp. "'Mildred, won't you come out with me tonight? Let's go and dine somewhere.' "'Oh, I can't. My aunt will be expecting me home. I'll send her a wire. You can say you've been detained in the shop. She won't know any better. Oh, do come, for God's sake. I haven't seen you for so long, and I want to talk to you.' She looked down at her clothes. "'Never mind about that. We'll go somewhere where it doesn't matter how you're dressed, and we'll go to a music hall afterwards.' please say yes. It would give me so much pleasure. She hesitated a moment. He looked at her with pitifully appealing eyes. Well, I don't mind if I do. I haven't been out anywhere since I don't know how long. It was with the greatest difficulty he could prevent himself from seizing her hand there and then to cover it with kisses. End of chapter 59 Chapter 60 They dined in Soho. Philip was tremulous with joy. It was not one of the more crowded of those cheap restaurants where the respectable and needy dine in the belief that it is bohemian and the assurance that it is economical. It was a humble establishment, kept by a good man from Rouen and his wife, that Philip had discovered by accident. He had been attracted by the Gaelic look of the window, in which was generally an uncooked steak on one plate, and on each side two dishes of raw vegetables. There was one seedy French waiter who was attempting to learn English in a house where he never heard anything but French, and the customers were a few ladies of easy virtue, a menage or two, who had their own napkins reserved for them, and a few queer men who came in for hurried, scanty meals. Here Mildred and Philip were able to get a table to themselves. Philip sent the waiter for a bottle of burgundy from the neighboring tavern, and they had a potage à oeuvre, a steak from the window à palm, and an omelette au kirsch. There was really an air of romance in the meal and in the place. Mildred, at first a little reserved in her appreciation, I never quite trust these foreign places, you never know what there is in them messed-up dishes, was insensibly moved by it. "'I like this place, Philip,' she said. "'You feel you can put your elbows on the table, don't you?' A tall fellow came in with a mane of gray hair and a ragged, thin beard. He wore a dilapidated cloak and a wide-awake hat. He nodded to Philip, whom he had met there before. "'He looks like an anarchist,' said Mildred. "'He is one of the most dangerous in Europe. He's been in every prison on the continent, and has assassinated more persons than any gentleman unhung. He always goes about with a bomb in his pocket, and of course it makes conversation a little difficult, because if you don't agree with him, he lays it on the table in a marked manner. She looked at the man with horror and surprise, and then glanced suspiciously at Philip. She saw that his eyes were laughing. She frowned a little. "'You're getting at me!' He gave a little shout of joy. He was so happy, but Mildred didn't like being laughed at. "'I don't see anything funny in telling lies. Don't be cross.' He took her hand which was lying on the table and pressed it gently. "'You are lovely, and I could kiss the ground you walk on.' he said. The greenish pallor of her skin intoxicated him, and her thin white lips had an extraordinary fascination. Her anemia made her rather short of breath, and she held her mouth slightly open. It seemed to add somehow to the attractiveness of her face. "'You do like me a bit, don't you?' he asked. "'Well, if I didn't, I suppose I shouldn't be here, should I? You're a gentleman in every sense of the word. I will say that for you.' They had finished their dinner and were drinking coffee. Philip, throwing economy to the winds, smoked a threepenny cigar. "'You can't imagine what a pleasure it is for me just to sit opposite and look at you. I've yearned for you. I was sick for a sight of you.' Mildred smiled a little and faintly flushed. She was not then suffering from the dyspepsia which generally attacked her immediately after a meal. 
she felt more kindly disposed to Philip than ever before, and the unaccustomed tenderness in her eyes filled him with joy. He knew instinctively that it was madness to give himself into her hands. His only chance was to treat her casually and never allow her to see the untamed passion that seethed in his breast. She would only take advantage of his weakness. But he could not be prudent now. He told her all the agony he had endured during the separation from her. He told her of his struggles with himself, how he had tried to get over his passion, thought he had succeeded, and how he found out that it was as strong as ever. He knew that he had never really wanted to get over it. He loved her so much that he did not mind suffering. He bared his heart to her. He showed her proudly all his weakness. Nothing would have pleased him more than to sit on in the cozy shabby restaurant, but he knew that Mildred wanted entertainment. She was restless and, whenever she was, wanted after a while to go somewhere else. He dared not bore her. "'I say, how about going to a music hall?' he said. He thought rapidly that if she cared for him at all she would say she preferred to stay there. "'I was just thinking we ought to be going, if we are going,' she answered. "'Come on, then.' Philip waited impatiently for the end of the performance. He had made up his mind exactly what to do, and when they got into the cab he passed his arm, as though almost by accident, round her waist. But he drew it back quickly with a little cry. He had pricked himself. She laughed. "'There. That comes of putting your arm where it's got no business to be,' she said. "'I always know when men try and put their arm round my waist. That pin always catches them. I'll be more careful.' He put his arm round again. She made no objection. "'I'm so comfortable,' he sighed blissfully. "'So long as you're happy,' she retorted. They drove down St. James Street into the park, and Philip quickly kissed her. He was strangely afraid of her, and it required all his courage. She turned her lips to him without speaking. She neither seemed to mind nor to like it. "'If you only knew how long I've wanted to do that,' he murmured. He tried to kiss her again, but she turned her head away. "'Once is enough,' she said. On the chance of kissing her a second time, he traveled down to Hearn Hill with her, and at the end of the road in which she lived he asked her, "'Won't you give me another kiss?' She looked at him indifferently, and then glanced up the road to see that no one was in sight. "'I don't mind.' He seized her in his arms and kissed her passionately, but she pushed him away. "'Mind my hat, silly. You are clumsy,' she said. End of chapter 60 Recording by Tom w